the speed on all things sports. Yes, yes, yes. With plenty of nonsense in between. Oh, look, here comes our fearless producer. Gwen and Chris starts right now on 97.3 The Fan. Bailey is 0 for 2 at a sack butt his last time. Here's the 0-1. Ground ball to the right side. That should do it. Sanders got it. Gets up, throws to first in time, and the ball game is over. Padres win the Petco Park opener by a final of 6-4 to four as a four-run seventh-inning rally gets the job done against the Giants. And with that, Matt Scraby is already celebrating a World Series championship for the Friars. We welcome you into Gwyn and Chris. 2-0-1 is a time. You've been out of control since that game yesterday. Guy uh, gets excited and guy gets crushed for being excited. Yeah, well, I don't want to. I, I, you're a little overexcited. I mean, it was a nice performance. There's no question about it. Padres beat the Giants six to four. I don't know that we can make uh, start printing playoff tickets quite yet, but maybe you know they win today. Then I'll, I'll start considering it. Uh, Chris Ello, Matt Scraby here in our Odyssey Palace Studios. Tony Gwynn Jr. is down at Petco Park where the Padres uh, posted that victory over the Giants yesterday. And uh, we welcome you into uh, Gwen and Chris. We've got a great one for you on this Friday, Friar Friday, our first of the year. And uh, among our guests will be Dylan Cease, our uh, newly acquired uh, ace right-hander. Uh, Join the program around 3 o'clock today. So uh, make sure you're tuned in to hear, uh, hear him. And uh, we'll also have uh, our AL Central. And NL Central season preview. So uh, we've got a lot of good stuff coming your way, along with our regular segments, the Daily Gambit, and uh, Chris versus the fans, the Big Five. Mike Schilt was on this morning with Ben and Woods. We will hear from the uh, the uh, soon-to-be manager of the year in the National League. All right, we've overblown a victory as much as we can do, Tony. But all in all, it was a solid day out at the yard, I would say. Yeah, um, it was a really solid day at the yard. A um, lot of good things happening yesterday. Um, there was some, everything wasn't uh, rosy, right? I mean, the bullpen had a little hiccup with uh, with Brito there at the, uh, during the, uh, what was that inning? Seventh? Seventh Sixth? inning, yeah. Seventh inning. Uh, and so, you know, that's something that you, you know, you, you're paying attention to, but all in all, can't be upset, man. Great crowd. Uh, Padres did a lot of things well offensively. Um, you, you got a you got a good start from you, Darvish. Outside of Brito, everybody else came in and threw the ball extremely well. And uh, you, you got to feel good about that. You know, I felt great about uh, a couple of things for sure, Tony. One is this uh, continuing three games into the season – run that the Padres are on hitting with runners in scoring position. And they are now 17 for 41. They had 11 such hits in that game, uh, victory over the Dodgers in Korea. They had four more hits with runners in scoring position yesterday. They're hitting a cool 415 in a situation that last year didn't seem like they hit any better than 115. And you know, I I know it's 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 an it's probably accidental it's probably just the way things work. But, you know, in talking with you about the things that you observe during spring training and watching every game and being around these guys, it really seems like that is such a focus this year to do much better in situational hitting. So I'm really happy to see it paying off, even if it's only three games. I think especially you guys, you know, obviously talking to me throughout course the course of spring training. And we've talked about it often in terms of what I was seeing. It's extremely encouraging to see it come out. And in the first three games, not even, not even let's put the, the runners in scoring position average and hits aside for a second. Yeah. It's just that they are doing things the right way offensively. When a guy needs to be moved, a guy is moved. When a guy needs to be brought in from third, a guy is brought in from third. Whether it's a hit, a ground out, a fly out, they are just executing those things. Well, now look, granted, it's three games. So, you know, great. They've done it for three games. There's still, uh, you know, 159 left to go. But I don't know at any point they ever looked like this last year. That, you know, there are games where they had these explosions where it was like, 
you know, you know, 10 runs, 12 runs, and they, they hit like gangbusters in those. But it, the, this one wasn't like it didn't pop out. Like it wasn't just an onslaught of hits. The Padres had to come back in that game to win it. Um, even in the game they lost in, in L.A., or excuse me, in Korea, the first game, they didn't hit. They didn't actually get hits with runners in scoring position, but they did everything correct to set it up. And I, and it goes back to what Victor Rodriguez, the Padres' uh, hitting coach, um, has has really been preaching, and that's in the middle of the field. Um, they they wanted to go. They want to do damage from left center to right center. That's where their mindset is. And when you watch the outs. Everything's pretty much up the middle. It hasn't been any very many rollovers or things of that nature. And I think those are signs that the guys are intentional about what they're doing at the plate. Yeah, it looks really good right now. And uh, I mean, I, it doesn't seem like didn't seem like they had 17 hits all season last year with runners in scoring position. They've already got 17 through three games. And you're right. I mean, they came through yesterday. They rallied from behind twice in the ball game. Another thing they probably didn't do a whole lot of last year, they get behind. Yeah. Even Xander Bogart said it to Sammy Levitt after the game. He said, you know, when we got behind last year, nobody ever gave up, but we never seemed to have the feel, you know, that right. we were going to come back. And la yesterday, you know, they give up the two in the seventh. It was disappointing. The Giants take the lead. And right away, Camposano base hit, Wade base hit, Merrill works a walk. You know what I mean? I mean, they yeah. just go right to it. And before you know it, they put four up there and uh, Cronenworth caps it off. I'm really happy for Jake to get off to a good start because you know who you are out there. Uh, you gave up on Jake Cronenworth last year. And many of you were very sour about Jake being, you know, in this position this year. But uh, so far, he's quieted everybody down with a really good start. He's got six RBIs, which is. That would be a whole lot if it wasn't for Mookie Betts already having eight. Um, the other thing, Tony, about this win yesterday, and you know that I am a stickler for base running. I point out every base running mistake. There was no base running mistakes yesterday. In fact, the base running was brilliant. Uh, from going first to third on base hits to Fernando doing something that pretty much only Fernando can do, going first to third on a ground ball to the pitcher, uh, the base running was great. Uh, Tyler Wade steals a base, moves up, run comes in on that. I mean, everything was good on the base pass. And those that, to me, wins a lot of games. I know we don't talk about it much. There's no fantasy categories for base running, but it's a big deal. And uh, I know that's something that Schilt and everybody's been focused on, too. Yeah, I'm not as I'm not as on top of the base running stuff as you are. You, you I, I think. With Soto being gone, and you know, that was really <laughs> your main culprit of bad base running, and yeah, I know. Kim so Kim so far hasn't really had a chance to to, to do anything. Yeah, yet. Kim hasn't gone crazy. It yet. was really just those two guys for the most part last year. Mm -hmm. But I see your point. No, they did a lot of good things. I mean, I I have said it from the very beginning since spring training. I, I like T Tyler Wade and what he brings to the table, specifically at the bottom of the lineup. Um, he can run. He can steal you a base. He's smart. Um, and you really saw that. That's the type of style we saw from um, the Padres really all, all spring. There was there was no homers last, yesterday. It was just, you know, trying to do whatever was whatever the scoreboard was saying, whatever the, the, the count was telling the hitter. Right. That is what they did to try to win the ball game. And that's how they that's how they won. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned the you know the you know Cosgrove had a nice sixth inning coming in for Darvish uh, after the lead runner got aboard. Uh, Matt Sui gets five outs and uh, he you looks know, good, man. He's looking really, really good. And, and I was, you know, I'm still impressed with Suarez. And here's what I was impressed by: I know he gave up a home run, yeah, but he he threw nine pitches, Tony, and eight of them were eight strikes. strikes. And yeah. that's what you're supposed to do with a three run lead. I said this to Scrabe yesterday. You you say with a three run lead, two outs, bases empty. You tell the batter, hey, here, hit it. You know, I want you to put it into play. I just don't want to walk anybody. And Conforto hit the ball, so good on him. But Suarez came back, got the very next guy, you know, next pitch, etc., and uh, put the game away. I mean, if he throws strikes like that, yeah. he's going to be solid in the ninth inning. I mean, you know, 
I, I think he made he made the one mistake to to Conforto. He threw a, a change up. At oh right, 91. you mentioned that. You said he that, did him a favor. He did. I mean, the, I didn't think he had any shot at the fastball. But to your point, that's what you're supposed to do with a three run league. Come at dudes. Right. He, he threw the change up. He left it up. It got it got crushed. But then he went right back to work. Got the out. Game over. And that's how it's gonna look. That's how. That's a great formula to win a lot of games. So we'll see if they can rinse and repeat to get Joe on the mound today. Um, I think that's a, you can, it's not very often that you get to play the first four games of the season and you get to use your number one and two starters in those first four games. I'm smiling because I really liked the, let's see if they can rinse and repeat <laughs> coming from a guy that I'm guessing does very little laundry in the Gwynn household. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? I can also see Tony doing it. You his think own he laundry. does some? Well, let's let's find out. Yeah. Let's find out. Does Tony Gwynn Jr. do laundry? Only when I need to prove a point. Right? <laughs> that you can gotcha. still do laundry. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let oh go ahead. No, my my wife takes care of me on that end. So she takes care of you. Okay, let's let's flip this around. Do you guys think Chris Ello does laundry in the Loriello household? No. Chance. No, no, yes. I don't do any. You don't think I don't think you do any really, Tony. I, what do you think? Yeah, I think you do some. I think I do a lot of it. If you guys know Loriello, <laughs> she's not doing all the laundry. <laughs> wow, she puts it in the machine and then she forgets about it, and somebody else has to come along and fold that bad boy. Wow, I, you're looking that would at Mr. You, Folder. Huh? You were looking at Mr. Folder. Mr. Folder. <laughs> Darn right. Do um, a lot of laundry. Uh, that's really surprising. Actually, really? Chris. I, 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 I thought you expect. would be guessing that just with because Lori, your, you know. your, your lovely wife, Lori, does like to have control over things. And so I think maybe, not the laundry. I can see Chris being too, <laughs> not, not the laundry, laundry, apparently. What about cleaning toilets? Is that your job? Uh, we have a uh, we have a oh, yeah, a, yeah. a lady comes okay. in. So all right, I have a, I, I a question for Tony that I've been asked maybe <laughs> maybe a hundred times since yesterday. But Tony, what is your official review of Fernando Tatis Jr.'s cleats? Yeah, yes, you are the go-to guy for that. The tribute to Peter. Yes, yes. yes. I think there's I think they're awesome. I think at this point, I mean, the, you know, he's going to be creative. I mean, even um, even Profar's. Uh, uh, rush hour joints that he's got oh, on yeah. out there <laughs> yeah. that's creative man like these guys get a a, a uh, just a a large area just to kind of be them so i am not I, I think they're both i think the i think toddy's to answer your question i think ty's cleats are awesome you're jealous of all of that aren't you Tony? i really because you dude. played in an era where if you did anything different at we all with your the, cleats you the, got a letter in the mail yeah we had the fashion police when i was playing these guys <laughs> get to do yeah whatever they want yeah tony did not get that so yeah uh, tony was, jr you have too much white on your shoes will you please pull over on your way back to the dugout he exactly. got that he got that stuff all the time so uh the other thing tony uh you know the peter seidler tribute and the heart and the initials and in center field all of it struck the perfect chord yesterday making for a great day all the way around his uh his widow uh threw out the yeah. first pitch did a nice job uh you know credit to Eric Gruppner, the Padre organization they they hit all the right notes yesterday i thought and you know it was really wonderful to see i i i love the touch of having the grass mowed out there with the with the logo now is that going to stay for a while do you know is is it out there today still the PS These, with the heart, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know if it'll be here all year, but it's certainly still here today. Um, it's a, it was a, as you said, they, it was a well done by the pods yesterday, and and you know, for the folks who couldn't come to the celebration of life, they got their kind of taste of it a little bit here before the game started. It was, it, it couldn't have gone any better, I think, for the Padres in, in on opening day. And uh, guess what today is, everybody. Tony Gwynn. Tony day. day. Tony Gwynn opening day. <laughs> Darn right. I knew you'd know the answer to that. Absolutely. This is where we get this is when we get serious. Tony Gwynn opening day. We'll talk more about that as we go along. 
Unfortunately, even though I'd like to totally forget about it, we have to touch on the Aztecs. And, uh, oh, no, uh -oh. there's no breaking oh, news. That no, breaking no, news. No, no, there's no yes, breaking news. Yes, this is news. breaking news. The NCAA has <laughs> determined that UConn, UConn cheated. cheated, and they've given the Aztecs <laughs> 31 more points added to their score. I actually meant to play this. Yeah, it was a tough night. I it was a struggle. Kind of lost its feel after uh, you blew it already. After Sorry, I did buddy. breaking it did. news. Thanks, Gravy, for know. messing that up. I know. <laughs> well, it goes with the theme of last night. Talk about NCAA tournament basketball, and uh, really, uh, even though it was a it was a totally downer of a night, it was uh, it's been an amazing you know run again by the Aztecs. So a little tribute to them when we come back as Gwen and Chris is underway. Friar Friday, Dylan Cease coming up in a little bit. Sit back, relax, enjoy. 97.3 The Fan. Never miss a pitch of Padres baseball. You can listen to every game on the free Odyssey app. Download it today and follow.
222 on the dot. Tony Gwynn Jr., Chris Settle, Matt Scravey. For as good as things were at Petco Park, they weren't all that good for the San Diego State Aztecs. Oh boy. Yeah. It uh it got it was, ugly. Our, it was our worst nightmare, it really. It was. was. It w- it was the thing that I think everybody was most afraid of, which is that uh ultimately UConn would just be too much to deal with. And yeah, that's that's a good way to describe I, it. I, I thought the first half, I, you, they did as good as a job as they could of, of kind of making it ugly and, and staying close. But the, the sleepy thing that happened was that, that three-pointer right at the end of the half. They had got it to six. And not to say that that would have changed things, but going at, going in at the half at six versus nine, where you're like one point away from being double-digit again against that particular team, I'm sure it was like, man. That sucks. Yeah. And then in the second half, they 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 took it to a whole nother level. A- Aztecs couldn't get any rebounds. <laughs> UConn was just playing volleyball with the basketball all game. Uh yeah, we watched it. That was the most and, annoying uh, part to me. The the rebounding thing for Scraby and I were so frustrated. We had it on during the show yesterday, Tony. And uh, you know, you're right. I, I think our worst nightmare came true. UConn played at an extremely high level. And they could have won the game even by not playing that well. And the Aztecs didn't play their best. But, you know, I thought defensively the Aztecs are really good. Yeah. Their first, you know, their first sequence. But when you can't get a rebound, obviously everybody's out of position, right? And you get those offensive boards, you kick it out, wide open three-pointer, or you go right back up for a putback. And uh, it was extremely frustrating. And I think, you know, once that lead got out to, you know, double digits, because it was still 12 with about 14 minutes to go. And I, you know, I was trying to dream of a miracle at that point. But then the Aztecs started rushing a little bit at the offensive end, trying to hit those 12 point jumpers that just aren't, yeah, oh, yeah. that just don't exist. 12 point jumpers. Well, you know, you're trying to get it all back at once and it just doesn't work. You've got to be patient and work for shots against that defense. But I, I don't know, you know, we've all been wrong before, but it, it looks like UConn is just going to roll to the championship. I, you know, I was pretty impressed with Illinois last night, but I can't see them staying up with this team and, you know, whether it's Alabama or uh, now Clemson in the final four, I can't see that. And even on the other side, whether it's Houston, Purdue, whoever, I mean, UConn just looks like they're at a level above everything else. And you look for a chink in the armor, I don't see one. I I, I certainly don't see anybody on their side of, of the bracket, you know, stopping them from getting to a championship. I, I can't see Illinois or Clemson beating them. I can see Houston getting out and running and making that one a, 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 a kind of a foot race. They got enough bodies to do it. Purdue obviously has a, a big man that, you know, this is the thing that can equalize a team like that is having a big man that can kind of clog it up a little bit. But the, the tough part about UConn is they can play both. They can play fast. They can slow it down and run the offense. Um, but they certainly look like a strong favorite. I mean, they they looked they looked really good. They've looked good the entire tournament, by the way. They've blown people out pretty much. I don't know if they've had a single digit game yet. Nope. In, they have in, uh they have won nine consecutive tournament games going back to last year, Tony. None of them have been within 15 points. Yeah, that's that's, that's ridiculous. In, that's insane. Yeah, that's nine uh, straight tournament games. None of them have been within 15 points. None of and, them. And you know, at that point, you're playing like the best of the best. You're not, you're not, these aren't the regular season games where you get a, you know, a uh uh a directional school. Yeah. In this case, you're playing like the best teams remaining. I thought it was interesting. Um, you know, Danny Hurley or Dan Hurley, their coach. I mean, he had a lot of really nice things to say about the Aztecs afterward. And uh, I think that was appreciative of uh, San Diego state fans, but this is a guy that doesn't leave a single stone unturned. And when I say that, Tony, do you know what the first thing he did after they won the championship last year was? He called no. Billy Donovan, who had coached the last back-to-back champion team in Florida, and said, what's the best way to do this? 
I mean, you know, he was already thinking. It's a bit presumptuous. Last year, it's a, you think it's too presumptuous? I think it's the best way to go that's, about trying that, to win again. If, if you're not thinking that that's what if that's not the goal the following year, then what are you doing? Yeah, what do you, I don't find that to be presumptuous. I find that to be pretty smart. You know, and, and he said he asked Billy Donovan. He said, "What's the best way to win back to back?" And Billy Donovan said, "Don't think about back to back." He mm. said, just think about getting better and executing, put your team together and let the chips fall where they may. And I mean, that's great advice from a guy who did it. And I think Dan Hurley is about to do it. Um, you know, they're a great club. And yeah. I mean, the Aztecs just were powerless as I think everybody else has been. So yeah, they, there's they, nothing they just, to be ashamed of. Not at all. You know, it was, it was nothing. Look, it wasn't fun. I, I, as great as they are. I mean, I hated all two hours of the game, you know, it was very annoying. <laughs> I gotta say that Chris was very, um, he was, he was within himself yesterday. Well, he wasn't there wasn't a angry. lot of yelling you can do. I was trying to get the officials to cheat for uh, everything I could do, but <laughs> Nothing it wasn't, was working. it wasn't going to matter. But, you know, as I, as I, as I kind of take stock of this whole thing, uh, you know, although yesterday was nothing to cherish and nothing to be remembered, what they've done over the last two years is Come memories for a lifetime, right? Come on. Come on, man. Yeah. I Seven mean. and two in NCAA tournament games, a final and a sweet 16. This team, they they ought to still applaud these guys when they get back home if they, you know, haven't done something already for them. So I, I truly believe, you know, I, I said it last year. I truly believe that ultimately these are the steps that are taken, right? Getting to the finals last year was 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 house money, right? We got there, right? And that's um that I think starts this the conversation, right? The the Aztecs down the stretch, as much as we complain that it didn't take much of for us to lose <laughs> to to fall out of the top 25 or even to get in there, right? <laughs> At the end of the year, when they probably played their worst, they still were in the top 25. And I think that goes back to what we were talking about they've kind of broke that kind of glass ceiling that had been over San Diego State by getting to that finals and now getting back to uh, a sweet 16 I think only starts the process for this team to be a, a perennial you know beyond sweet 16 there's there's just levels to it nobody just goes from out of nowhere to to being a national championship contender Right. The, the Aztecs have built this program up really since the time uh, Steve Fisher got here and it's been it's been continued now. Um, I just think that, you know, it, we were overmatched in that UConn game. But I think this still will lead to this program continuing to climb new heights. Yeah, I think the Aztecs keep going forward. I mean, they got knocked down last night, but I, I agree with you, Tony. They're going to keep moving on. They're going to keep. And for those people who think that they don't get any respect, keep this in mind. They finished fifth in their own league. They did not win the conference championship tournament, and yet they were still given a five seed, which was three seeding lines higher than any other team in their league. So not only do we know that they've arrived, but I think everybody out there knows they've arrived. And that's a great thing for this program and what Brian Dutcher's done. So I think we need to uh, also, now that the Aztecs are out, I need to see Zach Eady play against this other tall guy. You said it yesterday, and I thought about it all drive home for some reason. I don't know why you're in my head all drive home. But <laughs> you were saying that you want to see what Zach Eady does against a fellow tall guy, and that would be a fun matchup to watch. If they make the final, he'll yeah. get a fellow tall guy because that that guy in UConn was almost immovable last night. <laughs> I mean, Jaden yeah. Ledee went to the floor one time. He ran Jaden Ledee over. He did. On the way to the rim. And we were thinking that that's is. either got to be a foul <laughs> or, you know, because you don't put Jaden Ledee on the floor. But, yeah, that was a big dude. They were good. They are awfully good. All right. That means a lineup is in, huh? That is correct. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Line Do we want to wait until the other side? Oh, I yeah. think we should keep the people in suspense. All right. Sounds good. I love <laughs> let's doing keep, that too. Let's keep we'll, let's keep the people in suspense. When we return, we'll have the Padres lineup. We're going to Chris on the way.
It's so good to be with you on our first Friar Friday of 2024. Dylan Cease will be our Friar Friday guest. That is coming up at the top of this hour, so stick around for that. Chris Ello, Matt Scravey together in our Odyssey Palace studios. Tony Gwynn Jr. down at Petco Park where the Padres will take on the Giants once again tonight. And uh, that will get underway at 640. Uh, Sammy Levitt's pregame show brought to you by Eco Water comes on at 540 it's, following yes, our show. Correct. That means there's no Scraby Chronicles tonight no. unless you come back after the game. I think you ought to call uh, Adam and say, you know, I want to come back after the game and do a do a chronicle. I'm busy. Tonight. You're not going to do that. I'm busy. <laughs> I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. I find <laughs> that hard to believe unless it what do you do? unless busy con- concerns you playing video games. Playing yes. video games all night long. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, but I am going to do some cool scraby stuff. Scraby show stuff throughout the year. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do some new things and just see how they work out. I'm sure you will. Uh, the Scraby Chronicles have been quite the success so far, and I hope so. uh, you're doing a nice job. Um, before we get to the Padre lineup, I got a couple of uh, scores to pass along. First, the NCAA Women's Tournament. South Carolina is on display right now, and Indiana is uh, playing South Carolina, and Indiana is looking a lot like the Aztecs looked last night. It's pretty That's much funny. powerless to stop undefeated South Carolina. It's uh, 28 to 15 here in the it's second funny, quarter. It's funny you bring that up this morning. I saw the presser of the, the head coach for Indiana, and she was doing her best to to come up with why they would be able to, to possibly pull this off. They, yeah. she, was, she was telling everybody, you know, you can use this kind of thing to your advantage. You know, the kids, they read. They know that they're not supposed to have a chance, and you can try to use that to your advantage. Sounds like it's not working right now. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. As Brian Dutcher said on his way to uh, Boston, uh, good news is we're not playing the Celtics. Bad news, we're playing UConn. Okay. I don't know. They maybe should have played the Celtics. Maybe <laughs> Jason Tatum would have been missing his three-point shots last night. Uh, also, earlier today, Oregon State out of the Pac-12 defeated Notre Dame in the Ooh, uh, Sweet 16. So a good win wow. for Oregon State there. Notre Dame has that uh, freshman at the yes. point guard position. They yes. go down, huh? They went down today. So Oregon State moves on to the Elite Eight. Uh, tomorrow, Iowa will play Colorado. We'll take a look at that a little later. Caitlin Clark and all the money that's being thrown at her. Um, NCAA tournament does uh, continue tonight with the uh, – the other four games, we'll look at those on the Daily Gambit. And on the baseball scoreboard, the Atlanta Braves just did Atlanta Braves stuff. Mm-hmm. They rolled a seven in the top of the eighth inning against the Philadelphia Phillies bullpen. <gasps> it is now 9-2 Braves over the Phillies opening day in Philadelphia. Spencer Strider started, pitched five innings, struck out eight. And the other game today, Tony, Milwaukee beat the Mets 3-1. to one. Mets got one hit in this game. That was a Starling Marte home run. Christian Yelich homered for Milwaukee. But we had our first, at least I think it was the first, bench-clearing brawl of the year. Reese Hoskins, newly acquired by the Brewers, sliding hard into second base on a double play. Jeff McNeil, not happy about that. Not a fan of it, huh? No. Started screaming <laughs> at Reese Hoskins. The bench is emptied. The bullpen's emptied. Uh, the thing I'll remember most about it was Reese Hoskins, once he was over by the safe haven of his own dugout, looking out at Jeff McNeil and wiping his eyes as if Jeff McNeil was being a crybaby. It was pretty good, I got to say. It was pretty good, but I bet you that fastball that they stick in his ribs will be pretty good tomorrow. <laughs> you, you, you know, as as we would say from the other side, we got that pitch too. So, I mean, it, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you stick our guy with a fastball, guess what? We got that same fastball we can stick in your ribs. I thought uh, Jeff McNeil came off exactly how Reese Hoskins was uh, yeah, I think you're right, but I just don't his, know that the Mets will take it that way. They, they may not. I mean, uh, I will say Jeff Jeff McNeil had plenty of opportunity while Reese Hoskins was laying there on the ground, slowly getting up. If he really wanted to smoke, instead, Reese Hoskins began his trot back, and then the then the yelling and more gestures started. Good to come point, Tony. His way. Jeff McNeil waited till Reese Hoskins cleared the area, <laughs> and then decided to scream at him. And then there, yeah. it was like the hold me back. 
Like right, because you know hey, right. Jeff McNeil was pissed from the very beginning. I thought when it when it initially happened and he got taken out, I thought he if he had the ball in his hand, I'm glad he did. I I feel like he might have thrown it at Haskins, <laughs> but the slide didn't allow for him to catch it. So he was yelling from the beginning. But I'm just saying, if he really wanted to do some, Reese Haskins was on his back. Kind of just looking up. He's slow. I mean, you could have jumped on his back. You could have dropped a people's elbow on him. If oh, you people's to. elbow would have been amazing. He didn't do what, any what, of that. I, I love wrestling, but what's a people? I think I know. <laughs> it's the <laughs> rock. Know, is it he where you come like off this, the top he, rope? No, 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 no. You you get into the middle of the ring. The guy's laying down there. You step over him, and then the rock goes, <laughs> puts his hands like, let's go. And then he goes into this rope, and he runs, and he jumps over the body. And then he does this, Chris. He goes like, he does like some little dance. And okay. then falls on the pe- on the elbow. That's the people's elbow. Yes. That's the people's elbow. Okay. It's one of the most amazing things if I've Jeff ever seen. Jeff McNeil would have run and bounced off the right center field wall well, and I come running back the for the people's motions. elbow. That would have been something. That, that yeah. would have been hilarious. Yeah. Would have been great. That. Like, where's where's Jeff going? Oh, he's going to the right center. <laughs> he's going Reece, to the wall. Reese Hoskins is waiting for him because he's expecting a people's elbow. Well, I yes. want to miss it. Yeah, sometimes uh, the Rock took his time setting up the people's elbow, and yeah, and it's always nice. The other wrestler was, uh, you know, able to knocked wait out for enough. It. They were stunned right. enough. Yeah. That they he was stunned the enough for just yes. the amount of time he needed. Yeah. Just right. Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, Padres and Giants tonight, as I said, six forty the start at Petco Park. Joe Musgrove for the Friars, uh, rookie. Uh, I think he did pitch a little last year, though. Kyle yeah, Harrison, Padres roughed him up a little for bit the Giants. Uh, I hear good things about Kyle Harrison, though. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, he's a lefty, so the Padre lineup changes just a tad tonight. To it does. It does indeed. You have the first seven as as uh, as they have been really all seasons. Andrew Bogart, Fernando Tatis, Jay Cronenworth, Manny Machado, Ha Sung Kim, Jerickson Profar, Luis Camposano. Now it gets a little different, right? You got the lefty on the mound, so you get an egg, Eggy Rosario uh, at third. And you get Jose Azokar, a.k.a. Sugar, in center field, batting ninth. Jackson Merrill is left-handed only, right, Tony? Is he switching? That, no, oh, yes, he, he, yes, he only Okay, hits right. Left. So, yeah, I wouldn't expect him then to be in there against a lefty, at least not yet. But he's done – he's afforded himself awfully well. Campusano, two more hits yesterday. What would you do? You put the stat in here. It's a good one, Scraby. It's from Kevin AC. I'm not going to claim it. Okay. Well, I'm glad you gave him credit. But Camposano started. AC, I'm not going to claim it. No, because Kevin AC deserves all the credit here. Uh, 66 games for Camposano in his career, 19 multiple hit games. That's like one out of every three games. That's not too shabby. Uh, and Xander Bogarts has had three straight multiple hit games to open the season. Last Padre to do that was Tony. Did you know? Did no. they give you that same note yesterday in the booth? Uh, they might have. I, I don't you didn't get it? No. Uh, Mark Loretta, 2004, oh, yeah. had uh, multiple hits in the first three games. So uh, good on quick, Xander. Kyle, Kyle Harrison, uh, last year, five and two-thirds, six hits, six runs, two walks, five strikeouts against the pods. Well, let's see if we can get a rinse and repeat Indeed. of that. I like the sound of that. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, Mike Schilt was on the morning show today. We're going to have the Dylan Cease interview coming for you in about 15 minutes, so stick around for that. But some of the things that Mike Schilt had to say and an a enlightening interview with our Ben and Woods. And one thing Mike Schilt, I know he said after the game, was that he thought the Fernando base running move from first to third on a basically what was a ground ball to the pitcher. Mike Schilt uh, described that as sexy base running he did <laughs> he did and it was so so, so uh, you know why he has to describe it as sexy is because he knows there's probably only a handful of guys that can pull it off so <laughs> yeah, for sure if, if you say it's good base running then you might have other guys trying to do that and there's just mm, not many right guys he doesn't want anybody do else on his team getting the, uh, <laughs> right. the same idea but ben and woods had an idea of what to ask mike schilt this morning and the question was what other baseball plays does Mike Schilt think are sexy? I don't know. You kind of know it when you see it. I mean, um, uh, you know, there'll be more that'll come up that we'll uh, we'll attach that to. But you know, that was just a baseball play that you know it sets up. It's uh, it's, it's all the all the intangibles. You know, it's um anticipation. It's 
it's athleticism, it's it's um, aggression, it's trust, um, it's all the different things that, that make a really special baseball play. And you know, there was actually a fair amount of them yesterday. I mean, Toddy's was very well aptly described. Um, just a rest of great baseball plays going on the pitch, full count with Crony, and you know, didn't didn't hesitate. And the thing that was even more impressive about it for me is that ball's behind him. Um, you know, it's over on the first base side, and he's going towards second, but he was able to figure out what that looked like and make a decision. Um, you know, Jackson going first to third on the ball bogey hit was um, was really nice. Mandy going first to third. There was just really good base running plays yesterday that, for me, are a big differenti- differentiators and help you win baseball games. Mike Schilt sounding like Chris Ello there with his love of base running. Very good. Yeah. Happy to hear no that. Uh, Luis Campos. No doubt. What? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> What? You never mind. I said no doubt. That's yes. It. Oh. I was just being a parrot, echoing what Tony said. Fly away, I, I parrot. Really, I guess I really bothered him with that. Fly right away, there. parrot. <laughs> Come on. Uh, Mike Schultz was asked about Luis Camposano. We talked about him, a multiple hit game again. Here's what Schultz had to say about his young catcher. Yeah, Campy's demonstrated early, which is really impressive, at early stages of his career about what a professional not only a hitter looks like but a player looks like he just um he really loves the game studies the game is intentional about being great at the game and you know him him taking what the game gives you you know he's got the ability as we've seen to drive the ball you know drive the ball in the gaps out of the ballpark but he's also got the ability to recognize you know what i'm in a, i'm in a battle here um and, and i'm going to compete in two strikes i'm going to figure out a way to give myself the best chance to driving to run, get on base, whatever it takes in the situation. So he's also done a really nice job. He's grown a ton behind the plate, and, and uh, I'm enjoying working with him um, as our catcher. He's doing a, he's doing a really good job on all, all, fa- all facets of the game. By the way, I thought it was interesting, and, and I guess I should know this, but I didn't. You Darvish, when he's pitching with the, uh, the pitch com, calls every single pitch, Tony, right? Yeah, I mean, How a does lot he of guys- know – you Darvish has ten different pitches. How does he? Know, I mean, honestly, I want to see the the pitch come. How does he know what button to push? He doesn't look down at his waist ever. Yeah, yeah, he does. He does. Oh, he, he does. does. I saw him. You do, don't yeah. see him. Okay. Yeah. All right. He does. Most of the Padres pitchers call starters call their own pitches, um, and they, you know, I I assume they know the buttons because they're the ones putting it in there, and yeah. so. Um, yeah, but you'll see them. It usually look like they're messing with their belt. That's, that's them touching the pitch com and kind of getting it together. Or in some cases it'll be on their wrist and that's what they do. But most guys tend to put it on like near their waistband. Right. It's amazing how, uh, the technology and it also speeds up the game, right? You don't have to sit there while the guy's peering in for a sign for 20 minutes anymore. (laughs) Um, all right. One more thing for Mike show, maybe two, uh, Johnny Brito. The young uh, reliever uh, did uh, cough up the lead yesterday. Tony was uh, saying, uh, I think off the air, that uh, the breaking ball wasn't quite yeah. quite snapping off the way he'd wanted to. But what will Mike Schilt do with uh, Johnny Brito's usage here early in the season? Well, I mean, you kind of explained it. Um, you know, it's a guy with experience in the bullpen, you know, successful experience over when, when he was with New York, um, comes over in the trade. Is it, you know, clearly can be a hybrid guy, was given the opportunity to start, you know, was really pushed out. Um, you know, we got Dylan um, in the trade. And so we put him in a role that's a little more, he's got some experience doing, um, give him an opportunity. Like you said, big arm, loved his fastball. You know, just yesterday, a couple of balls found some holes that, you know, created some opportunities for them to their credit. And, um, you know, he's, he's throwing the ball well. He's got a nice arm and those strikes and, you know, a lot of good things to like about a guy that can come out of your bullpen. All right, so that was not answering the question. Well, he's a manager. So. I agree. I, I'm just pointing what, out the obvious. What was the what was the question? I guess the question was what about his usage? usage? Yeah. He didn't really touch on what he's going to do. That's okay. I, I don't know. What you, I guess you asked the question was about usage. Well, the the no, the, the, this is what it's labeled as, and and Paul usually labels these really great. Um, so it says asked about Johnny Brito's usage. Oh, okay. Yeah, we don't know what the question was. So we don't know. That's if it was true. Really Good point. 
one last thing for Mike Schilt. Um, is he superstitious about his lineups? Uh, no, it's not superstition. It's, it's, you know, what gives the best chance to compete, you know, going into the game and during the game. So, um, you know, we, we faced three righties and, you know, felt like that was our best lineup to compete and, and to win. So that's what we ride with. And as we already pointed out, they are facing a lefty tonight, and there are a couple of changes at the bottom of the uh, lineup with um, Eggy Rosario getting the call at yeah. third base tonight and also uh, Azokar in center field for Jackson Merrill tonight. So I imagine we'll see Kyle Higashioka soon. I mean, no need, right, with the first – Two games in Korea and then a week off yeah, for Capasano to have a week off. But he'll he'll play this weekend, I'm sure. I'm yeah, for probably probably play Sunday. He'll yeah, play play tomorrow, but most likely Sunday. And mm -hmm. uh, then the I think who's comes here? Cubs coming next? Uh, Cardinals. 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 Yes. Knew it was a Cardinals. C -team. C -team. <laughs> Cubs. Cardinals. <laughs> I'm trying Cubs, to think of Cardinals. another C team. Same I thing. can't. Starts with a C. You know what Tell I'm saying. Me. Oh my goodness. If they do, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but if they do postpone any of these games this weekend, do you think they're like, will they Funny have to carry it over that, to September? Mr. Scraby, we all, you know, as, as broadcasters that travel, we always are hunting out the worst case scenario. <laughs> and so we have already highlighted the Thursday off day being a day night doubleheader somehow. Oh boy. Yeah. Oh, that's, this that's, coming Thursday or this coming this coming Thursday? Because we both share an off day on Thursday. So. You think that the Giants would just come right back next Thursday, maybe, and play two <laughs> games? They, they could come. That right, would be yeah, a worst they, case they, scenario they, for sure. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah that's that's that where would. that's where we're at with it right now. What I'm thinking is that the Padres uh, used Darvish in the first game in Korea. They used Musgrove in the second. Now, these two again, they right. used Darvish and Musgrove. <laughs> If it rains for three more days, we could just have <laughs> Darvish and Musgrove again. <laughs> next the first time in the history of baseball where right? the first two starters started the first six games yeah. of the season. Yeah, just hold out for a little more rain. That'd be, that'd be kind of a cool advantage right there. Be interesting indeed. Although Dylan Cease, we are looking forward to seeing this guy yeah, on the no, mound. The, poor Dylan. Keep getting, yeah. keep getting keep his spot skipped back. over. <laughs> Until we see him on the mound, we'll have to hold you over with our Friar Friday interview. Dylan Cease, coming up when Gwen and Chris continues. Best time of the year in San Diego is baseball season, and no one's more excited than we are on Annie and Elston. We know you're all America's Finest fans, so listen to America's Finest talk show. Annie and Elston, weekdays 10 to 2 on 97.3 The Fan. Three bands, one stadium. Journey to Flippard. The Steve Miller Band. Three rock and roll Hall of Fame icons. Their biggest hits. Together, Friday, August 30th, Petco Park. Tickets on sale now at Def Leppard Journey 2024.com. Does managing your health care feel like a full time job? Bounced around from one doctor to the next? Did they get your lab results? Were you supposed to bring those? All the forms, the bills, the not a bills, the press forward and repeat these options. Does healthcare have to be this way? At Kaiser Permanente, all of us work together to make healthcare easier. And with integrated care and coverage, all you have to do is focus on your health. Learn more at kp.org. Kaiser Permanente, for all that is you. Listen up, NBA fans. DraftKings, an official partner of the NBA, is bringing you a fresh way to get in on the hoops action with Pick 6, their newest fantasy app. Getting started is simple. 
Download the DraftKings Pick 6 app and sign up using promo code KWFN. Select between two and six NBA players and choose if they'll have more or less of a stat. Track your picks and play against others for a shot at huge cash prizes. Download the DraftKings Pick 6 app now using promo code KWFN and take on the competition with your best NBA player picks. Only on DraftKings Pick 6 with promo code KWFN. The crown is yours. Gamble problem call 1-800-GAMBLER 18 and over in most eligible states but age varies by jurisdiction eligibility restrictions apply void only in states where DraftKings pick six operates for up-to-date list of states please visit dkng.co slash pick six states void where prohibited see terms at pick six.draftkings.com it's one thing falling in love with a house picturing yourself moving in and calling it home and quite another navigating the world of price negotiating mortgage lenders and finding the budget that works best for you an agent who's a Realtor can make understanding that world easier. Realtors have the expertise, access to proprietary data, and tools to help you get from imagining living somewhere to actually doing it. That's the kind of help we can provide. Because that's who we are. Realtors are members of the National Association of Realtors. Find what you love, love what you find. A total wine and more, there's so much waiting for you. Spirits and beer. Thousands of wines walk right through the door. It's all here to explore. With guides in the know, when price is so low, it just might blow your mind. You're gonna find what you love. And love what you find. Drink responsibly, B21. You'll never miss any San Diego State news if you follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We're approaching this as a tune up for the tournament. You know, we want to go in there. We're playing a great opponent on their home floor, and we want to see if we can make the next step as a team. At 97.3, the fans. KWFN and KWFN HD1, San Diego. We're not your typical sports talk show, and quite frankly, that's a good thing. You'll see what we mean when you catch Ben and Woods weekdays, 6 to 10 a.m., on San Diego's number one sports station, 97. 97- 7-3, the fan. Always live on the free Odyssey app. The work day is coming. Welcome back to the program. It is Tony Gwynn opening day. And the Padres will be taking on the Giants tonight following our program. Sammy Levitt's pregame show at 540. Padres and Giants at 640 with uh, No-No Joe on the hill. Joe Musgrove against uh, left-handed young uh, lefty uh, Kyle Harrison of the San Francisco Giants. This hour, 97.3 The Fan brought to you by Ashley Furniture. Celebrate and save at Ashley's. Anniversary sale with hot buys, your choice of color, starting at just three hundred and ninety nine bucks. Ashley uh, sleep mattresses starting at two fifty. Plus, receive a free adjustable base with select mattress purchases. This is only at Ashley. Something I'm going to be checking into soon. We got to get a new mattress scrape. You keep saying it. Well, I you know I'm busy working. What are you doing? Well, Working. Oh, okay. Doing the show. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. We were Cello, here Matt Scraby night. here, Tony Gwynn Jr. down at Petco Park. Friar Friday. Uh, before we get to our interview with Dylan Cease, updating you, South Carolina at halftime is pulling away now a 17-point lead over Indiana in the women's sweet 16. Earlier today, Oregon State beat Notre Dame. And I just saw they put up a stat. Oregon State was minus 21 in turnover differential Ooh, and geez. still won the game. How does that happen? I guess they shot really well. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess Notre Dame did not shoot really well. Minus 21 in turnovers and you win the game. That's crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. All right. Uh, Friar Friday, Dylan Cease, our guest. Tony and I caught up with him. And uh, I know you'll enjoy this visit as much as we did. First Friar Friday of the year. 
we get none other than newly acquired Dylan Sees. Dylan, first, welcome to San Diego, man. Welcome to the show. Happy uh, 2024 season. Oh, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's great to be here. A, uh, it's, it's definitely as sunny in San Diego as everyone has, has told me, so it's been great to be here. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're going to get at least a day of this in because it sounds like we're going to have some rain tomorrow and Sunday. Yeah, um, looking like what, it. Yeah, we'll let me talk to you a little bit about the, the transition. Obviously, uh, you get traded over here to, to San Diego at the time where we're all in Phoenix where spring training is. And um, I think everybody just assumed that we see you what once we came back from Korea since we were leaving on the day you were traded. But nevertheless, you yeah. end up in Korea. Just talk about the kind of whirlwind you went through uh, to just to get to Korea and now finally being back in the States. Yeah, so I got the call probably around three or four in the afternoon. And uh, at first it was, you know, they were kind of saying like, hey, you might have to get on a 7 a.m. flight to, to Korea. And uh, I was, you know, kind of just in a scramble to like get everything taken care of and figure out the logistics. And thankfully they were able to find me a, a nighttime flight. So... Oh, yeah, so four o'clock at the call, then start preparing, start getting everything ready. And uh, that, that following day, I wake up and uh, I go to the White Sox facility. I get all my stuff, say goodbye, everyone, and kind of just have stuff to do throughout the day to just, you know, get to the point where I can make it to the airport. And then uh, finally make it to the airport, have uh, around seven, have a two over two hour layover in LAX, and then uh, a 13 hour hot flight over to uh, Korea. <laughs> Dylan, obviously it was very important uh, for you to, you know, be with your new teammates as soon as you could. And, uh, you know, I think it was a great, a great, uh, you know, move on your part, you know, to say, Hey, I'm now a Padre. I want to get right there and be with these guys. Uh, you know, every time we ask guys about being traded, I, I think there's a little more to it than we just think. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you're not just a name on a roster. You're a guy that got to know all these people in Chicago, got settled there, uh, has it been at all difficult for you to make the transition or is, is there a little happiness in the sense that it doesn't appear like the White Sox are going anywhere anytime soon? Yeah, it's, it's always challenging. Um, like you said, there is, there is the human element behind it where we are more than just, you know, our stats and our this and our that. But, uh, I feel like it took me within a couple of days, I was kind of getting, you know, really settled in with the idea and, and uh you know getting getting more used to it and I'm, I'm at the point now where as soon as i figure out my housing i, I pretty much really feel settled here um this uh, i've been really impressed with with everyone with this organization and just how comfortable and easy they've made everything so i, I already feel like i'm you know a part of the team and although there is an aspect of that where you know you kind of have to earn you know you still have to earn everything so you know i want to go and perform and and you know pull my weight but uh, it's, it's been a great experience so far, and uh, yeah, it was definitely bittersweet because I had a lot of good friendships and relationships, and uh, really was just very comfortable in Chicago. Uh, it's a, that's a great city, and, and uh, it's it's really enjoyable to live there. So it was uh, it was it was interesting to have have to basically you know no longer be a part of any of that. So I definitely found my mind, especially on the flight over uh, to Korea, kind of like thinking and, and remembering some, some memories back from Chicago and just how quickly the time went by. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very excited for this new chapter. Dylan Siege joins us here on our first Friar Friday. He'll be tomorrow's starter for the pods. And, and Dylan, it's, it's so interesting. You brought up kind of already feeling settled. It was, it was kind of uh, eye opening to me. Your, I believe it was your first bus ride came, on our way to the field uh, in Korea. And the thing I noticed mm -hmm. was how seemingly comfortable you were with everybody, but more I, I thought was impressive was everybody was comfortable with you. Is that just your normal kind of demeanor or has it been yeah. a little bit of, you know, you feel comfortable being in this, in this organization? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I think a big part of it is just, it's a really good group of dudes on, in, on this team and in this organization. So uh, it's just been kind of one of those things where it's been almost seamless. And uh, I get to know everyone pretty quickly. And, and, you know, obviously, honestly, being in Korea is, I think everyone's a little bit uncomfortable. So uh, I think yeah. we're all kind of 
experiencing something new and kind of, I guess, bonding and sharing, you know, an experience like that. So, um, I don't know. It's just, you know, I definitely was, I was definitely a bit nervous and a bit anxious and, and all of that. Just, you know, I, like you said, I mean, it was a, a huge whirlwind, um, but really I was just kind of trying to stay in the moment and uh, just keep focusing on, on baseball and what I had to do to really get ready for the season. Dylan Cease is with us, and uh, we're really excited to have him uh, here in San Diego and on our program, our first Friar Friday interview of the year. Uh, people around here, Dylan, I don't know if it's got back to you, but they're calling you the the right-handed Blake Snell. Uh, that's a pretty high compliment considering Blake Snell just won a Cy Young. You yourself nearly won a Cy Young a couple of years ago, and I'm not big on the analytics of baseball, but they – they say that you pitched pretty well last season, very similar to how you pitched two years ago. Didn't have the same results. How frustrating was last year for you? And what are you working on to try to get back to two years ago? Yeah, I, I found last year to be pretty frustrating. I feel like I really only pitched, you know, up to maybe 30 or 40% of my ability. I, I had a lot of starts where I just wasn't executing much of anything. So, um, yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is just really making sure that the process is locked in, which which kind of gets refined every year. And for me too, it's just making sure the mechanics are locked in, and I'm I'm kind of focused on what I need to focus. And uh, yeah, it's actually been really nice working with uh, here, kind of getting his input on things and being able to talk with really all the other starters and and all the other pitchers. Um, yeah, so I mean, it really at the end of the day, it's just. With, with pitching, it can be something as simple as you just get a little feel from, you know, you, you tweak something and, and then all, all of a sudden it's automatic. And unfortunately, it's not always as easy as it, you know, happening instantly. Last year, I mean, I really didn't, I didn't really find a good feel toward till the end of the season. But I'd like to think that a year like last year is sort of just like a character building year and, and a year where it's like, you know, if I can go out there and, and pitch and, and, to provide value and do things while I don't know where the ball is going and I, you know, don't have a good feel, then, uh, you know, that's kind of like showing that even at my worst, I'm able to, to go out and provide something and compete. So uh, hopefully I just learn from it and, uh, and, you know, carry, uh, carry a little bit better uh, energy and mindset and all that into this season. Dylan, one of the things I, I, I've noticed in watching you pitch last, last couple of years and in your, your outings here so far in a Padre uniform um, you are a part of this kind of generation of pitchers. Um, and I'd say like in the last 10 years that doesn't have the long arm swing, it's kind of short, almost mm -hmm. by your ear. Have, have you been one of those guys that was always this way or did you make an adjustment to kind of get to that where, where you are now? Uh, I never did anything consciously to change that. It just mm -hmm. happened as, as years went by. Um, I'd like to think it's just my body kind of figuring out the most efficient and, and best way to sustain, you know, high, high power, but with kind of the endurance and, you know, going out every five days and, and pitching. So uh, if you, there's actually videos out there. My, my twin brother sent it to me the other day and it's uh, some guy made a video of like my arm path from 2016 to now. And it, I used to have an extremely long one, but really? uh, for whatever reason, it's just shortened up over the years. Twin brother. There you go. I, I, yep. here's, here's, that's something we did not know. I don't know that no, anybody knew that, but, uh, Tony, you can, uh, you can drop that now on the broadcast. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, hey, Dylan, I, I don't know where I get these, some of these crazy questions. Last year, we had a guy named Matt Carpenter. He's now at the Cardinals. And, uh, I don't know. The big thing we all noticed about Matt Carpenter is his mustache. So mm -hmm. we get Dylan Cease. And first thing I said is this guy rocks one of the best mustaches in baseball. <laughs> But then you came to San Diego and you've kind of covered it up with the beard. Uh, is this what we're going to get this year? Or could we see a return to the mustache only? Yeah, anything's possible. Um, <laughs> I had uh, I had a much longer beard in in, uh, in Arizona. And then um, before the flight to Korea, I wanted to get trimmed up. And the, the guy ended up cutting off a bunch of it. So um, I borderline was ready to, to go back to the stash then because all that hard work I put in just got put away but it's uh it's possible I, you know for now I'm, I'm enjoying the beard but 
uh, I, I do like the mustache, so I, I would definitely say there's a solid chance it comes out. And now, I'll, one more before I let you get out of here, Dylan. Uh, obviously, your start day is tomorrow, should the weather cooperate. Uh, you got the one start here earlier this week. What's your feelings about the pitching in this ballpark and and off that mound? I know every mound is a little bit different every city mm-hmm. you go to. You've had the opportunity to pitch here before. Uh, well, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, a pitcher-friendly ballpark. And uh, mix that with one of the best defenses around, um, you know, all, all, the, all the cards are definitely stacked in my favor. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, can I go out and execute and, and put the ball where it needs to be put? Uh, but yeah, I'm feeling great about it. I mean, uh, like I said, uh, definitely, definitely one of the more uh, advantageous situations of my career in terms of pitching. So uh, yeah, hopefully it's just one of those things that I, I get more and more and more comfortable, and uh, you know, I'm able to carry that all the way through the end of the season. Well, we definitely know everybody here in San Diego is certainly excited to have you as a part of this ball club. Good luck tomorrow on your first start, and uh, we appreciate you coming on today. Thank you. I appreciate you guys having me. Thanks, Dylan. Dylan Cease cool. there uh, for the San Diego Padres. Pretty good start to our uh, Friar Friday visits. Uh, Dylan Cease, number 84. Didn't get a chance to ask him about that, but got the mustache information. Yes, and the twin information. And the twin brother information. I always think about this, like when you have twins, mm-hmm. one one's really good at sports and i guess the other wasn't as good at sports or something like that's yeah. very uh right. it's gotta be hard for the other twin all i remember about twins is that uh our friend uh the great ted leitner okay who had twins at oh, one point all right uh i mean his wife at the time had yes, twins yes um and uh, the twins they're all grown up now but back in the day when ted used to do the morning sports report okay on uh, another network, as they say. Yes. Back in those days, you would give all the scores of all the games. And every time he came to the Minnesota baseball score, Ted would go, the twins! Because his twins drove him crazy. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I used to laugh every time he did that. I, I would imagine it would be tough as a parent. My, my, one of my close friends uh, has Man. three kids. Mm-hmm. And one of them was two, and then he had twins. So, so it was you very go tough. right from uh, man-to-man defense to a zone to a zone, correct? Yeah, three is you know that. Then you gotta you gotta do like a that. That's tough. Triplets, yeah, quadruplets. But I don't uh, even know if that's a thing. Ted Leitner always had a special affinity for the Minnesota Twins. <laughs> I always thought it was funny. Ted's always well. He's always been funny. Yeah, Ted's always fun. All right. Um, we're going to check a little traffic here. And then we come back. We got our daily gambit. And then we have our AL and National League Central Division previews. That's right. So a lot coming up. Tony's going to step aside for a moment, but he'll return for the preview session. So stick around. More Gwen and Chris coming up. From the.
Hello, hello, 322 the time. Chris Hello, Matt Scraby together in the Odyssey Palace Studios, Tony Gwynn Jr. and Petco Park. We'll have our AL and NL Central Division previews. If you missed the uh, AL West and the NL West, that was earlier this week. Wednesday. You remember what day? Wednesday. You'd have to look it up on the Odyssey app. Well, yeah, it was Wednesday. That was the last day. Odyssey app, or you can go to uh, 973thefansd.com. Everything is there for you to enjoy once again. Also, Dylan Cease, if you just missed it, is online. Right? Correct. You can listen to uh, Dylan Cease again, or for the first time, or just whenever, whatever you want. You can listen to it 10 times if you want to. We'd appreciate it. Well, we... If you move to 10 different locations, because then that makes 10 different listens. So don't listen to it 10 times on the same IP address is what I'm trying to say. I see. Thank you. Yeah. I always got to even know what an IP address is. The internet protocol address. I see. I see. It tracks you basically. Okay. Uh, (laughs) Let's uh, get to today's winners, losers, Daily Gambit. Do you like money? I think about money a lot. Do you like money without doing anything? Uh, duh. Winning. Do you want to make money while watching sports? I think Washington is a mortal lock. Washington! Woohoo! If you answer yes, this is your segment. Just don't blame us when you lose. Nothing is ever your fault. It's your game. Take it. Gwen and Chris go through the top bets of the day in The Daily Gambit on 97.3 The Fan. Daily Gambit is our daily sports betting segment here on Gwen and Chris. Please, everybody, gamble responsibly. I did a fan duel fantasy lineup yesterday, Chris. Uh, it was one of those uh, offers that get, you know, opening day offers or whatever. Okay. I was so terrible. So I reminded myself why betting is so hard and making money is very hard, especially in daily fantasy betting it's not good it's not good but you gave in i did well yeah. I, I mean i only had to pay a dollar for it but i'm not going to be doing it this week gave into temptation i did it was a dollar never getting that dollar back no i am not <clears throat> uh speaking of dylan cease and speaking of anything you hear on 97.3 the fan the odyssey app lets you jump back to the moments you miss while you're listening you can go back listen on demand if you missed a guest feature something crazy that happened from earlier We've got you covered. Download the free Odyssey app, search 97.3 The Fan, and tap earlier today to get started. Today to get started is what I was trying to say. We bet on North Carolina and Alabama last night. North Carolina, four and a half point favorites in this game. Alabama, however, won 89-87. Both Chris and I lose on this one. Yeah, we bet against the Alabama coach. Did you know? Okay, I I know I'm breaking... uh, the mold here right now in this segment but did you know blake snell was also a twin not a minnesota twin no no he he has a twin okay. brother did not know that's crazy so we replaced one guy with a twin with and another right handed blake snell the right handed blake snell yeah. dylan cease all right thanks. very good thanks that's jacob interesting for that stuff. information Thank you, jacob uh iowa state one and a half point favorites over illinois last night you chose illinois i chose iowa state and Illinois won 72-69, so you get that one right. Notre Dame, the women, three-point favorites over Oregon State. We just talked about it. I picked Oregon State. Chris picked Notre Dame. Oregon State won 70-65. Is it Notre Dame, Notre Dame? I say Notre Dame because no, Notre it's Dame. the fun way to say yeah, it. Yeah, Notre Dame, but no, it's Notre. All right. Notre. N-O-T-R-E. Notre. It's not N-O-T-E-R. All right. Oregon State, 70-65. South Carolina right now. Ooh, I was uh, looking up earlier saying, because South Carolina is a 15-and-a-half point favorite over Indiana, and I was saying we can pretty much assume that South Carolina is going to win by 15-and-a-half or more. But right now, Indiana is only down 13, so we got to keep an eye on this one in the third quarter. Still a, a long way to go in this one. So. Yes, sir. Indiana's uh, doing uh, a good job of hanging around against the undefeated Lady South Carolinians. South Carolinians, yes. Yeah. All right. I don't so. like to say their nickname. The Gamecocks. I know. They're, I, I, I don't really like to say Oregon State's nickname either. But that's what their nickname is. The Beavers. Let's move on. All right. What you got? Well, we got uh, NCAA basketball tonight. Marquette 
North Carolina State, the one double-digit seed left in the men's tournament. Marquette's favored by seven and a half. Hmm. Over the Wolf Pack, I'll take NC State right off the bat. I think they keep it going. They might even win. I, so I'll take the points. I'm going to go with you because if there's like a destiny team to get to like the Final Four, it's got to be North Carolina State. Plus, so. I love North Carolina State's pudgy center. center. Yeah, he's great. He's fun to watch. He is. Uh, Purdue is five over Gonzaga. Zach Eady and company beat Gonzaga all the way back in the Maui Invitational in December by 10. Tonight, mm. they're favored by five. Scraby. I got to think that Zach Eady has uh, put the bad tournaments behind him, and I think Purdue wins. Purdue. Well, I'll be rooting for Gonzaga, so I'll take them plus right. the points. I I don't like Purdue. Yeah, why not? Um, all their players think they're a whole lot better than they really are. <laughs> they acted on the floor, and I'm not a fan. Well, Zach Eady is the back-to-back -back player Zach of the year. Not Zach Eady. Oh. He just does his thing. Oh, it's the other guy. The other guys go prancing around, and they don't realize <laughs> that the only reason they're that open is because everyone's guarding him. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Houston by four over Duke. I've heard a lot of people say they think Duke's going to win this game straight up. That's the kiss of death. I'll take Houston, which survived a game effort from Texas A&M last weekend. Should relax tonight. Duke has one of my least favorite players I on know. there as well. I know, but Houston. Filipowski. Yes. Ugh. But Houston is a team that does seem to struggle. Okay. Take Duke then. You can do it. No, Bob Bollinger no. will be happy with you. No, I'm going to take Houston. Bob wow. Bollinger. We're both taking Houston. Yes. Okay. Uh, one more. Tennessee, three and a half over Creighton. Mm. Creighton in the Big East. The Big East has not lost a game yet in the tournament. Creighton Tennessee's is always the two there. seed. Creighton's a three. Well, Creighton got to the Elite Eight last year. Somebody beat them. Yes, the Aztecs. We did. did. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are they going to get back to the Elite Eight or Tennessee? Who do you like here? I, I'm going to go Tennessee. You're going to take Tennessee. Yeah. I'll take Creighton. And Creighton, I always like to take points when I think the team can actually win outright. All right. Tomorrow, UConn is only eight and a half over Illinois. Either Illinois is a whole lot better than I thought they were. I think that's the case. Or people are not paying attention to what's going on. UConn has won nine straight tournament games by 15 or more. So you're telling me all I have to do is give eight and a half points? That seems like the easiest gimme ever. And I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> I am going to take UConn and happily give eight and a half points. What about you? Hmm. Yeah, I, after what I saw yesterday, it would be stupid for me to bet otherwise. I'm going to go UConn. Okay. A um, couple games on the women's side, and then we'll wrap this up. Stanford later on, two seed, four and a half points over another NC State. Hmm. NC State on the women's side as well. Uh, although NC State on the women's side is a three seed. Stanford by four and a half. You are up. Um, Stanford's not the Stanford that we know, right? No, they're not as dominant as they have been. I'm going to stick with uh, NC State. All right. What I'm only going to take Stanford because they're in the Pac-12, and the Pac-12 is very deep in women's college basketball this year. All right. And I think that's why Stanford lost a few more games than we're accustomed. Okay. One more game tomorrow on the women's side. Caitlin Clark and Iowa. The Caitlin Clarks. Seven over Colorado. Mm. I go first. I just told you that the Pac-12 is a lot deeper than we think. Yeah. Colorado's going to give Iowa a game. And also there's the Caitlin Clark betting factor, which means they add points to Iowa because people on the team. just know who she oh, is. So I they're see, yeah. likely to bet on Iowa. So they have to give a few more points to try and get people to bet on the other side. I think you get a value mm. if you bet against Iowa, which I'll do. I'll take Colorado, plus seven. I think the further in the tournament Iowa goes, the better Caitlin Clark is going to get. Okay. Because she seems to live the hype. I'm going to say Iowa. Iowa there. Okay, very good. Meanwhile, Indiana, right at the end of the third quarter, 
has closed within 10. Yes, they have. Of South Carolina. And they got another free throw here. You got to make your free throws. Yeah. Come on. Well, when you're trying to pull off an upset, every little bit helps. Yes. For sure. You have to make your free throws. South Carolina is 34 and 0. Oh, she missed both of them. <laughs> what are you doing? You sound like a Hoosier over there. Well, all I mean, of a sudden. There's one thing that bothers me in basketball, and it's when you miss free throws. Really? Yes. You just think they should be automatic. I don't think they should be automatic, but you got to make your free throws if you're going to win a game. It's what my dad beat in my head growing up because Your my dad's dad. a, my dad's a huge basketball fan. He yes. played college basketball. Mm -hmm. He coached basketball. I he just by the way, does yeah. that does that you gotta make your free throws or you can't win? Does that apply to every game? Every basketball, game. every mm -hmm. single game. Yeah. Illinois last night. Okay. 15 of 29. They were awful at the free throw line. It's the only reason the game was so close. Anyway. Okay, so if they would have hit their free throws, they would have won easily. They still won. Just saying. More Gwen and Chris coming <laughs> I up. I want to say something, but I got nothing. I got nothing either. Tony Gwynn Jr. rejoins, and we break down the AL and NL Central Division races with predictions and award winners. It's the way only the Gwen and Chris show can do it, and it's next. Spectrum.
Petro's authentic Mediterranean cuisine, not only in Coronado and La Jolla, but also at Petco Park. If you're on your way to the game tonight, have some Spiros. Do it. Yeah. Scraby knows. Oh, man, Chris, I've lived off of your Spiros for the last two days. Yeah, feast. We I'm going to have to get back on SD Fat Loss here <laughs> very shortly. Not because of the unhealthy food, just because it's so good. It's I healthy, eat a but bunch you ate it. a lot of it. Yeah, yes. for dining or takeout options, visit Spiros Cuisine. Dot com. Uh, upset alert. I think that's fair to say. I mean, South Carolina is 34 and 0. Women's basketball. Indiana's making a run here. Eight minutes left. It is down to a eight point spread. 65 57. So the Indiana still got a little ways to go, but they were down like 20 before. They need to get Indiana needs to get number 54 out of here. First, she misses both free throws. Then she just travels. <laughs> Scraby's really upset with Indiana right now. It could right be 65 59. He wants to see them come back. South Carolina's. That was an awful shot. South Carolina's choking right now. They've had three straight air balls. So I think they're starting to feel the pressure. We'll let you know how that turns out. But first, we got to check some traffic. Then we get to our preview of the uh, AL and NL Central, the way only the Gwen and Chris program can do it. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Davick. Busy afternoon, south on side of the 805 before the 163. There is a stalled vehicle in the center divide. Also stalled transition ramp eastbound 8 to south on 805. Rest of our problems are in the North County. North County 5, Carmel Mountain Road. Got a collision in the center divide up ahead before Delmar Heights crash over the right shoulder. Also north down at 15, just before the 78. Motorcycle accident blocking the HOV lane. We still have a crash on south of 15 before Carmel Mountain blocking the HOV lane. I'm Kelly Danik with Quinn and Chris, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3, The Fan. And that music can mean only one thing. Time to uh, return to our 2024 Major League Baseball preview. On Gwen and Chris, we did the uh, AL West and the NL West earlier this week. So let's get to the uh, AL Central. And the NL Central, we do have the advantage of one game having been played by everybody, so that could factor, change things. That could factor into some of our decisions. But uh, Scraby, take over and lead us through this, All and right. uh, we'll uh, we'll get going here. All right, let's start as Chris said with the AL Central. Tony, who's going to finish in first in that division? I'm gonna go with the Cubbies. The Cub. Wait, I'm going with the AL, 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 AL. Yeah, I think oh. he said AL. He, 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 he yeah, he, uh, he. Did I say NL? No, you said AL, oh. but he, you told him you were going to do NL first, oh, and then you switched yeah. up on him. I don't think I did. It's nice but going. Okay. I think you did. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Good job, Tony. You know that the Cubs are in the Central at least. <laughs> he does know that. He just doesn't know what what league they're in. That's yeah. All, all right. Exactly. AL Central. Do you need me to list the teams for you? <laughs> oh, <laughs> what a guy! All right, I'm done now. I'm done now. Either way, it's almost that, fair to that say is, that because we always complain, all of us, about the AL Central that that is where players go to disappear from the scene. <laughs> well, now that Scraby has clarified the league that we're actually doing right now, I'll give you the Minnesota Twins as my Twinkies, American, American League Central winners. All right, Chris, Twins repeat, uh, says Tony Gwynn Jr. I'm going to go with an upset here. It seems like the uh, AL Central is one of those where uh, the divisions kind of change hands every year. I was really impressed with the Detroit Tigers, you know, last year. I mean, they finished a little under 500, but they were in second place. I thought they had a much improved season under A.J. Hinch. I think, you know, he was the guy that led the Astros during the crazy scandal-ridden era, but I think he can manage. And I think he's getting something out of this young team. I think they're starting to come of age a little bit. I like what they added on the pitching staff, Kenta Maeda, Jack Flaherty. So I'm going to go with the Tigers in an upset here. I'll All take right. them in the AL Central. I took the Twinkies, as you, you said. You also as want well. Twinkies. Okay. Yes. Very uh, good. Chris, who's your last place team? This is an easy one. Uh, you know, it's interesting. We The AL and NL West were really easy, right, with Oakland and the Rockies. And I, and most people think the White Sox might even be worse than both those teams. I, I've seen some people rank the White Sox even lower than that. Uh, you know, they pretty much have given up. I mean, the Dylan Cease trade will tell you that was the one star they had on that staff. I'm going to say the White Sox. <laughs> okay. I was like, is he going to go in a completely different direction after all this? No, White Sox. No, White Sox. I'm also going to say the White Sox. Tony? Um. 
I'm going to say the White Sox, but I think the hype train for the Royals may be a little bit too hypey. There's a lot of hype, but there's too uh, many former Padres there, Tony. We can't root that hard <laughs> against the Royals. I'm just saying they might be able to they might be able to shut some people down for a little bit, but can they score? Yeah. That's, I mean, so I, I'm going to go with the White Sox because they, they seem like they're trying to lose right now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, I'm up first for the MVP of the AL Central, and I'm going to go with Carlos Correa. Don't take my shirt off. Really? Carlos yes. Correa? Because he uh, – It's about was, time he has a big season. I was reading last night that his plantar fasciitis is completely gone. He feels really good, and he went three for four yesterday. So maybe a bounce-back season. I'm taking a chance. Well, there it is. One game is uh, affecting your decision. I'm taking a chance, Chris. <laughs> He went three for four. He still has the do you want to Do you want to reconsider this? Because no. you, well, hang on. You are the biggest Bobby Witt Jr. fan I have ever seen. You made him your number one pick in fantasy. Well, yeah, it was the second and, overall pick. And you're not going to choose him for MVP because why? You don't want to jinx it? Uh, no, it's nothing like that. I don't believe in that stuff. I just think Carlos Correa is going to have that good of a season. Interesting. Because right. if the Royals are terrible and Bobby Witt Jr. is really good, then who cares? Okay. Fair enough, Tony. Um, I'm gonna go with Luis Robert. I think he continues to ascend. He had a tremendous year last year. I think he just keeps getting better. So I'm gonna give him the MVP of this division for right. the Central. Chris, he's gonna pull in a uh, Andre Dawson back in the day when he won <laughs> NL MVP on the last place team. That's pretty awesome. Right. Yeah, yeah, you got to have a great season to do that. So. All right, after all of this, I'll take Bobby Wood Jr. then. <laughs> He's the best player in the division, and uh, you drafted him number two overall I did. of every player in baseball. It was either him or Julio. Who would you have taken, Tony? Bobby Wood Jr. or Julio Rodriguez? Julio. Dang it. I knew I, 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 I sat there until the end of my selection. You just love Bobby Witt too much, but I'll, I'll oh, take him Bobby. for MVP. It's uh, not a bad, it's not a bad. He's choice. a 30, 30 no. guy. That's yeah. pretty good. Uh, by the way, I think it was the AI of sports illustrated that suggested the Padres trade Ethan solace for Luis Robert jr. And yeah. that will never happen. Um, all right. Tony Cy Young of the AL central. Oh man. You know, Dylan Cease is no longer in the uh, no. He doesn't count American League Central. Yeah, so he's out of there. How about I go back to old faithful, Mister Pablo Lopez of the mm. Minnesota Twins? You like that guy? He's got you. good, just filthy stuff uh, off that bump. Chris, uh, I'm going to go with the guy that I wound up with on uh, our fantasy league. And I uh, pitched six shutout innings on opening day. And I hear really good things about this guy, uh, Tariq Skubal. Oh, yeah. Of the Detroit great. Tigers. He's their ace. He's uh, he's ascending I from everything I've read. So I, I don't know if he's good enough to win the whole division Cy Young. But uh, if the Tigers are going to have a good year, maybe he will too. I thought about going Michael Walker. I thought about going all those guys, but I'm going with a guy who uh, I picked up yesterday morning, and now he's my favorite, Garrett Crochet of the White Sox. Struck out eight yesterday, did some great things. So Scraby's basing all of his picks on one day of no, baseball. His, basically. No, <laughs> this is what you say in the draft. Yeah, that is true. That is true. His ERA plus last year was great. He showed some promise in 2021. So... There we go. Plus. You got him. You, yes, I did. Good All right. luck with that. Uh, Chris, you're newcomer to the division. Yeah, I'm looking at the rosters right now, and I'm trying to find a newcomer. And uh, Should I go first? I have mine. The White Sox certainly don't have anybody. Uh, Cleveland is coming with pretty much the same squad. Uh, Detroit, young, but Mark Canna. I mean, he's, <laughs> a, he's, a, he's an addition. But I, I can't see him being that dominant. I'll tell you what. I'll go with Jack Flaherty oh, all right. of the Tigers. All right. I, I don't know. Tony, you can know better than me, but I he this guy was a you know one of the best pitchers in baseball three years ago. The injuries have, I guess, taken their toll. He doesn't seem to have the same stuff or command, but I can't really think of anybody else, so I'll go with him. <laughs> um, I'm going to go with Stephen Wilson. 
Stephen Wilson of the gonna, Royals. I'm, 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 no, I mean, the, the White, White Sox. Sox. Yes, our old friend Stephen Wilson. I, I'm going to say that he gets opportunities to close, and he's going to show that he's a closer in the league. So I'm going to be. I think it's. Out in, I think it's optimism. interesting. You're picking all White Sox here in this division, <laughs> except for and they're Twins probably not going to win a game. Correa. Yeah, <laughs> this is very true. Interesting, uh, Tony. You're newcomer. This is a pretty easy one. I mean, I can go. Hmm. I'm gonna say one A or one B is either gonna be Seth Lugo uh, or Michael Walker will be uh, yeah, the newcomers yeah. of that division. There, both of them we know very well. Pitched the their minds out last year. We're able to capitalize on it there in uh, free agency. So I'm gonna go with the. Uh, I'll tell you what, Tony Lugo Waco combo. I was gonna combo. say I'm, I'm I'm feeling very, uh, you know, very. Uh, gregarious here oh, yes. i don't know if that, that was the right word but... you're feeling very outgoing here no i'm just going to give him both guys i'm going to let him have two. Oh, you're thank being you. generous generous that's what there i wanted is. yes there being generous is. you can have both guys tony yeah thank you sir the uh, law so, firm of lugo and waka lugo waka very good all right let's go to nl central and we're going to start with you chris your first place team uh nl central man the injuries have really taken their toll before the season started but I bought into the Reds. They're young. They're hungry. Um, they've got so much talent that they can't even fit everybody onto the roster. And uh, they got a young pitching staff that's ready to bloom. If they can just get back to healthy, they got to get Matt McClain back. They got to get their cheating third baseman back, Noel Marte, <laughs> for the second half. I'll, I'll take the Reds in a in a in a tight division race. All right, I'm gonna go with the Cubs because I guess there's a lot of hype and I fell for it. Tony, who are you going with for first place in the NL Central? Oh, you already said it, actually. The Cubs. Yeah, remember? Another I Cubs, remember. yeah. Tony, yeah, do I Cubs, need buddy. to name all the teams in the Central? Of the year? <laughs> what a guy he is. <laughs> I know. I, I'm being Thinks very – You know, I'm being very annoying today, i got to yeah. say. Yes, you are. You're in um, a good mood and annoying at the same time. <laughs> last place team has got to be the Pirates. They just – our last place every single year. Was it last year that they started out really hot? Yeah. And then yeah, for about the first half, they had a really nice yeah. run. Uh, Tony, who do you think is going to be last place? Wow. It's a tough decision. I mean, I mean, it, it could be the Brewers. Mm. But everything is telling me I need to pick the Brewers, but I'm going to pick Pittsburgh. Can I stay with them? I'm All right. Stay with Pittsburgh. Chris? I'll tell you one thing. We didn't get this right last year because none of us picked no, the Cardinals to finish no, last did. in this division. Hard to believe they would be last again. Uh, I am going to go with the Brewers. You know, yeah. we see teams in baseball go from last to first. It happens a lot. We very rarely predict first to last. But I think in this division it's possible. Like the Brewers, you know, no Burns, no Woodruff. Those were the two guys that really carried them. Um, you know, Reese Hoskins is a nice addition, but uh, I think Yelich is a little bit older. Two young guys alongside him in the outfield. I'll say the Brewers come in last. How about that? All right. Tony, who's your MVP of the NL Central? There's some good options. Uh in this division, honestly, as bad as it is as up in the air as the division is in terms of who's winning, there's some talented players in this division. I'm gonna oh, MVP. That's a that's a strong one, though. How about we go with Paul Goldschmidt? No, oh, he was the only guy who had hits yesterday. Is that right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yes, that's good. right. He had all of that. Was hits why yesterday. I went with him because I saw his highlights last night. <laughs> Chris, NL Central MVP. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Yeah. The guy that won it last year, uh, if they would have given the award, I think would have maybe been Bellinger, mm. you know, yeah. but I, I just, I, I'm with everybody else here thinking that he's going to go back to more normal. Uh, Goldschmidt is always a reliable guy, and he's coming off a, an off year. Um, Man, I'm trying to find somebody on the Reds, and I, I, I could go with your favorite guy, O'Neal. But no, he's on the Pirates. I mean, Ellie Dela Cruz. Yeah, I love Ellie. Yeah. Or I could go with O'Neill Cruz of the uh, of the Pirates. They're both yep. really great young shortstops. I'm gonna go with a shocker here. What? I think his first name is Christian. 
Encarnacion Strand. He went over for yesterday, but oh wow, well, <laughs> that's it. You and Are your, you, is that going to be your response? Is that going to be everything today? all year? You're just going to remember oh, what everybody did on opening today. day. No, I'm just saying I, I I was very locked into opening day baseball yesterday. Oh, he went over four yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll take him in a, in a in a shocker, and then if he has a good year, you guys will say, "Hey, good call." Yeah, that's true. Uh, I'm going to go with Ellie De La Cruz. He's electric. You are going with the red I, shortstop. I, I think he's going to be better and better. And also, did you guys see that video of him the other day doing an interview in English for the first time? That was awesome. Awesome. I posted that. Awesome. I love when he said guys he worked do that. extremely hard on yes. his English so that he could uh, speak English. But he, he was talking more about why it was important. He felt like for him to learn it. And he, he wants his he wants the folks who are listening to be able to understand him. He wants to be able to understand them. Good it was him. just a it was just a really cool thing to watch a, a young guy do. Who's, it's some having to. I mean, I, I can't imagine having to do all that. Seriously. Seriously. And that's why I love him. L.A. De La Cruz MVP. You got and, it. and then he said he he was like he made a joke of like well I don't know about interpreters anymore you know kind of thing <laughs> with Otani and all that. Um, all right, I don't even know who's up. Chris yeah. Cy Young, Cy Young for the uh, NL Central. I think it comes down to uh, well last year again this would have gone to Justin Steele, but going on your uh, way of thinking, he's already hurt after opening day, so. That's a bad start. <laughs> I think it comes down to a couple of guys. Uh, Sonny Gray coming to the Cardinals. And the guy that they think's going to be the greatest pitcher ever every single year. And he just never is. And who's that? That's Hunter Green. He's your guy. Not this year. All I've right. totally given up on him in fantasy baseball. I have thrown him back into the pile. And so that is probably why he will come back to haunt me this year. I'll take Hunter Green. That's crazy, Chris, because I legitimately did have Hunter Green too. Because right. for the very same reasons, like what that I gave to, up no, on him in going, fantasy. Well, that and he's going to turn it around. He has to. He has the talent. Tony Cy Young of the NL Central. Hunter Green. Wow! Wow! Three, three for three. three. Wow! That's okay. pretty good. Let's see. Let's All see. Right. Him. Newcomer. Let's see him do it for the NL Central for me. Churios. Of the Brewers. Jackson. Cheerios. Jackson, that's right. I didn't want to say his first name because I wasn't sure if I it think was that's Jackson. It. Yeah, number two overall prospect in baseball. Yeah, and he, yes, so I'm going to choose him. Tony, you're a newcomer. <sighs> My newcomer. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 probably the best pick. Cheerio. 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 Chris, are you going to make no, it a clean sweep? No, you know sweep? what? My newcomer Who? is Reese Hoskins, his teammate. All right. Reese Hoskins. Chris? Reese Hoskins is a really underrated player. Uh, I like that. Um, trying to look through some of the possibilities here. Uh, Michael Bush for the Cubs. Eh, not really enough. Uh, Jimer Candelario of the Reds. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if the Reds are going to be big, you mentioned uh, Hoskins. I'm going to go with the guy I mentioned earlier, Sonny Gray, All the right. Cardinals. Big addition. Goes right to the top of the rotation once he's healthy. Cardinals have a turnaround season. He's one of the reasons why. All right, good stuff, guys. Those are our AL and NL Central picks. We'll finish up with our uh, East picks next week. And when we get back, you have a chance to take on Chris and Chris versus the fans. 833-288-0973. Qualification for Las Vegas. Up for grabs. Give us a call. The dogs have their day. I'm Chris Mack here to help you beat the books with BetQL. After a chalky round of 32, three underdogs barked and one outright in Thursday's round of 16. Will it continue tonight? The BetQL model has all their plays for tonight's action, but they're going kind of chalky. Houston minus four is a three-star best bet. I'm Chris Mack. Bet smarter and beat the books. Download the BetQL and BetMGM apps today. eBay Motors is here for the ride. Go ahead, feel your engine. Admire that perfectly installed exhaust. Your vehicle's moving along this freeway like it was made from fresh installs and a whole lot of love. With eBay Motors, you get over 122 million parts to keep it running. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, they'll be the perfect fit every time. Plus, at these prices, well, we're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. 
Ralph's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices. And when you download the Ralph's app, you can enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. Plus, you can earn fuel points to save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. So it's easy to save big. Ralph's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Fuel restrictions apply. And right now, USDA Choice Bone-In Ribeye Roast is on sale for $7.99 a pound with your card and digital coupon. Limit one. Ralph's, fresh for everyone. At Cox Mobile, we know you're smart. You brush your teeth in the shower to save time. <laughs> make coffee ice cubes for your cold brew. Mm. And wear goggles to cut onions. You also added Cox Mobile. So smart. Now you're running on the network with unbeatable 5G reliability and All right, welcome back to Gwen and Chris. Hope you enjoyed our uh, previews. The American League and National League Central Divisions. We'll look at the East earlier next week. I liked our picks. They're not bad. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see if we get any of them right. Probably not, but. Yeah, probably not. Uh, I'll tell you one thing. Indiana, give their uh, kids a lot of credit against uh, undefeated South Carolina. They have taken this right to the wire. Indiana was down as many as 22 points in this game. Right now, they're shooting a free throw to get within three. Scraby's beside himself because they missed it. Still 16 games. seconds to can't win. You can't win. Got to make your free throws, Scraby says. Yeah. Uh, it's 78-74 right now. South Carolina, 16 seconds left. She made the second free throw. So uh, we'll keep you up to date here. Indiana is going to have to foul and then – you know, hope for a couple of misses themselves, but 78, 75. I mean, that's, that's given the, uh, that's what you were wishing the Aztecs could do last night, right? Just somehow hang around and have a chance, but UConn would have none of that. None of it. No. Uh, NCAA men's tournament game getting underway shortly. Marquette and North Carolina state Padres and giants tonight. 540 for Sammy Levitt's pregame show, 640 for Joe Musgrove and Kyle Harrison. You don't care about any of that stuff. What you're really interested in is qualifying to win a trip to Las Vegas. Our grand prize. 
Get a two-night stay at the Font in Blue Las Vegas and dinner for two. Immerse yourself in timeless elegance at the Font in Blue Las Vegas, a luxury resort gaming and meeting destination. The legacy of Font in Blue Las Vegas built upon more than 70 years. Sublime beauty and paralleled service and timeless design. Book now at fontainebluelasvegas.com. If you had one shot, one opportunity to take down the human almanac himself. Howdy do. Now is your time. Listen to me, this guy is dangerous. Now is your opportunity to win a prize. Well, I hope you know Jen for. Chris versus the fans starts now on 97.3 The Fan. All right. Here are the rules. You have to make it through three questions. Each question will get more difficult. If you get the question right, you move on. If you get it wrong and Chris gets it right, you're eliminated. But if Chris gets it wrong, then you move on to the next question or you win. If you're a first-time player, let us know. That was a really good one. Thank Way you. to go out the week with that. Uh, you just need to let us know before the first question. You'll get that question for free today. People ask, why do you give first-time players a, a, a cheat? And I say because I want first-time players to play. Right. We want to. Uh, we want to We're encourage them. Yes, we want to encourage people who have not played this game to uh, call in and play. Absolutely. And you know the other th- encouragement I would give, and, and we've seen it many times, Scrape. I don't always get the questions. Correct. Which means you can advance and win, even if you're not an all-time sports trivia nut. Yeah, backwards sweep. It's a backdoor suite. It's happened many times. So, you know, you should try it. You should take a shot at this game and you could end up going to Las Vegas. But let's see what happens today. Yeah. Also, uh, if you win today, you will win a four pack of tickets to the good guys 23rd McGuire's Del Mar Nationals, April 5th through the 7th at the Del Mar Fairgrounds. Purchase tickets or register your vehicle at good guys.com. Also, that qualification for Las Vegas. Let's get to our first player today. Oh, I should also say, a lot of these questions are going to be based on the Padres game yesterday and the Padres season so far of three games. Okay. So I just want you to all to know that before we go into it, because if like that doesn't interest you, you might want to hang up. If you don't know the answers to the, if you did not watch the game yesterday, probably not going to know these answers. Not going to Your yeah. chances are going to be less. Yes. So let's start with our first contestant, Josh. What's going on, Josh? Not much. How about you guys? Hi, Josh. Uh, Not much. Ready for the weekend. Are you ready to play? I'm ready. All right, here we go. How many runs did the Padres score yesterday? Really? Six. Scravy working overtime. No, that's okay. That's a question number one, Chris. Here we go, Josh. Question number question. Question number two. Jackson Merrill is number three for the Padres. Who wore that number for the Padres last season? You said last season? Correct, last season. Didn't need an answer. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, I'm sorry. I had to buzz you before I get the people on me. Chris, you know. Uh, Before you start my timer, Indiana ran out of time. Uh South Carolina hangs on, but they got a scare. They did. 79-75, the final. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who wore number three last year. Uh, I'm trying to remember. You know, they had a lot of guys come in and out. A lot of guys left. Juan Soto wore number? I don't know what he wore. I don't like Juan Soto. No, he wore 22. He did. Uh, Blake Snell. No, he wore four. I don't know. Uh, jerks and Profar. I'm guessing like everybody. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you may hate this answer. Bob Melvin. He did have a number. Oh, that's year. fair. Yeah, that's fair. He but was number that, three. That's good. Good. That was maybe even a three-pointer question. Really? Okay. Yeah. Someone actually told me that yesterday at the game, and I was like, question right there. Yeah, very good one. All right. All right. Good Josh, for you, though. Josh, you're still there. You get to the final, uh, I'm still right here. The final one, yeah. All right, this one has nothing to do with the Padres because third questions need to be difficult. So here we go. All-time great pitcher Satchel Paige finished his career with what Major League Baseball team? Satchel. I'm going to guess the Indians. The Indians. The tribe. Stay there. The only reason I'm pretty sure I know this is because we brought it up before. He pitched when he was like 57 years old. 
for the Kansas City A's. Wow. Because he, he played his Negro League games with the Kansas City Monarchs. So they yes. brought him in for a they brought him in like for a promotion and he ended up striking out like five guys at 57 <laughs> years old. Satchel. Sorry about that, Josh. Sorry, good, Josh. Good knowledge, Chris. I'm not gonna be mad at that one. Okay. All right, let's get to our next contestant, Evan in El Cajon. What's up, Evan? I'm actually just a little bit tired. I spent all night last night cramming uh, the history of ancient baseball stadiums. So I can <laughs> well, you know what? That could help you out later on in life, Evan, because we may be asking. If it doesn't about help you today. Again. It'll help you at some point. Yeah. I w what was it the other day? I was asking like all the different stadiums that Babe Ruth did stuff in. Anyway. All right, Evan. Here we go. Question number one. <laughs> Which team scored first yesterday in the Padres Giants game? The Giants scored 50 50. Giants scored first. Yeah, I figured you would know that anyway, Chris. So I was happy with that. Here we go, Evan. Question number two Who has the most hits on the season for the Padres? So far. So far. Who's leading them in hits? I believe it's Cronenworth. Cronenworth. Going crony. <laughs> Stay there. I'm going Xander. He's got Xander. three straight multiple hit games. Sorry, Evan. Sorry, Evan. Playing. But the good news is, you know, the beginnings and the demolition story behind Shy Park in Philadelphia. Yes. I mean, if he did his research, he would I'm know sure that. he did. I, I he said he was Evan looking up that. all the ancient stadiums. He said he stayed stadiums. up all night and he was tired. Oh, I That's appreciate right. that about him. Yes, sir. All right. Let's go to our next contestant. Uh, it's either Jamie or Jaime. I'm not sure, but you tell us, contestant. Hello. Hello. It's Jamie, and I've been called worse today. Oh, oh, oh gosh. wow. All right. Are, are you okay? Do you need to talk about yeah. it? <laughs> Do we need to open a, okay. a session of sports court for you? Yes. <laughs> are you ready to go, Jamie? I am. I was at the game yesterday, so let's try and get as many of those. In the oh, game. perfect. Oh, well, all, right. all right. Here we then. go. It should be good. Uh, who picked up the win for the Padres yesterday? No, oh, at least you have to have a little knowledge for that. Oh, <laughs> I was either Max Dewey or I'm gonna say Max Dewey. Nice job, sticking uh, with your guy. Happy to hear that bell. Yes, sticking with you your got guy. it right. Nice yeah, Max Dewey got the win. He, he did. did. All right, here we go. Question number two. A little bit more difficult. Two Padres stole a base yesterday. Name both. Us on Kim. Okay. And Wade. Nice job. Oh, he was nice at the job. game. Yes, you were. It. All right. Now Nailed we're it. done with the Padres question. So now you need to know some other stuff. But you are we're on the question to say number to three. Me. Say that again, Jamie. You're killing me with a other category. Oh, uh, well, I'm going to give you a, let's see, I have, uh, I'm going to give you a baseball question. Kirk Gibson won his first World Series with what team? His first World Series would have probably been with the Dodgers. The Dodgers. <laughs> Unfortunately not. Chris, do you know this? I do. You do? He tortured the Padres in 1984. Oh, and he capped off the World Series oh. with a home run against Goose Gossage. Oh, yeah, Tigers. Yeah, I knew you knew it, so that's why. I, sorry, sorry about Jamie. that. Hopefully, Jamie. your day goes better. There's a very famous uh, sequence in that game where um, Dick Williams came out to tell Rich Goose Gossage to walk Kirk Gibson okay. late in the game. They were down a run, but there were two men on. Uh -huh. Goose Gossage says, "Uh, uh." Really? I'm going to get him. Okay. Sparky Anderson yelled out of the Tiger dugout to Kirk Gibson, he doesn't want to walk you. Oh. Ah. He wants to come after you. Okay. Kirk okay. Gibson won that battle, wow. unfortunately. He's also the guy, right, who did the who who um did the the guitar thing or whatever he did when he was running around the bases after he homered against Eckersley yes, with the Dodgers the same guy right? that was in 88. That's okay. Kirk Gibson. All right. Defensive back from Michigan State before his Baseball Dang. playing career. You know, it really bothers me when guys are just so athletic because yeah, Kirk Gibson you can give athlete. us a little bit of your athleticism, people. Share. Share. Share and share alike. All right, let's go to Bill in San Diego. Bill, how are you? Oh, wait. Bill. 
I'm hitting the button, Bill. I don't know what's happening. Okay. Bill, are you there? Okay, Bill's there. Bill, how are you? Yeah, I'm here. Good, good. How are you guys doing? Pretty good. Uh, here we go. Question number one. <laughs> Who has hit the only Padre home run of the season so far? Wow, still only have one. Yep. All right, Chris. Manny Machado. That is correct. Deep into the Korean night. Yes, it's still flying. All right, we're gonna go to a tiebreaker. Really? Tiebreaker. tiebreaker. Yes, because we have lots of stuff to fit into this hour. Okay. What is our name, Chris? What? Or let's. Oh, let's, let me Kirk get Gibson. You. Yeah, Kirk Gibson's good. All right, let's see. Kirk Gibson. Kirk. I keep calling him Kurt. His no, name is Kirk. Kirk. I knew that too. He also managed the uh, Diamondbacks. Oh, he's had a big career. That is been a around big for a long time, Kirk Gibson. All right, let's go to uh, our next contestant, Chris in Mission Valley. Chris, are you there? Hi, Chris. Hey, what's going on, guys? Good to touch out with you again. Yes, you Good too. To have you Thank on. you for calling in. Uh, you got we're a 50, do the tie 50 shot right here. So I'm going to ask Chris a question. He's going to give a number, and you're going to guess whether the actual number is higher or lower than what Chris guessed. So, Chris, how many home runs did he have in his career? That's a fair question. How many years did Kirk Gibson play in the 17. major league? 17 years. 79 through 95. Yeah. In the last few, he was fading a little, but. Kirk Gibson had o over 350 home runs. I'm going to say he had 355 even. 355 home runs. Chris, is the actual answer higher or lower? I'm going to take the over. You're He's going to say take it's the higher. Over. Kirk Gibson? <clears throat> wow. It's what not even it? close either. Really? What was it? 255 oh. home runs in his career. God, I Sorry thought he averaged that, at least 20 per season. Um. He did in the middle of his career. Yeah. He had I know he tailed off at the end with injuries. He had 27, 29, 28, 24, 25 in five straight years. So but uh, other than that, not quite. All right. All right let's go to our next contestant. Uh, we're gonna go to Brad. Brad, are you there? Hey, what's up, guys? Hi, Brad. Not much. Not much. Here we go. I'm gonna give Chris a question. Or uh, I'm gonna ask Chris and you're gonna guess. Stolen bases, Chris. How many did he have in his career? Well, he ran a little bit. I didn't realize this about him. Um, 17 years, 10 per year. Okay. 175. 175. Brad, is the actual answer higher or lower? Let's go with uh, lower. Lower. <laughs> Sorry, Brad. <laughs> he Kirk had, Gibson ran a little bit. He did. I said he, had, he ran a little bit. 284. He had stolen more bases. stolen bases than home runs. He did. He did. That's surprising. That I don't think surprising. anybody would know that. I wouldn't have got that right. Yeah, I didn't know that he was such a runner because he looks like such a big dude. He was, but guy, he had really good speed. Remember, he played DB in college, yeah, yeah, so he yeah, could it run. Makes sense. And guy, they ran a lot more in those days. They created runs. But anyway, yeah. Kirk Gibson's a great player. He's real close to the Hall of Fame. I mean, he's like in the Hall of really, really good. Oh, but yeah, I guess he can't. Just be not in quite been in the Hall of Fame. Uh, all right, let's go to Ryan and El Cajon. Ryan, are you ready? Let's go, Ryan. Yes. We're all counting right. on you. Here we go, Chris. How many RBIs did he have in his career? Whew. Kirk Gibson. Yeah. Uh, let me see. 17 years. Times 75. No, nah, that's too many. Times 60. Zero? Oh, my God. I, I can't add. I can't subtract <laughs> under pressure. I mean, do me I can't do multiplication under pressure Let me like try. this. Let me try. What are the numbers? 17 years. Okay. I, I'm you said 75? Average, no, I'm, I, I readjusted that because of his 60. injuries. I think 60 times 17. 60 times 17 is That's zero. my answer. Seven times six is 42. So 14. We're taking way too long. He had 1,000 RBIs. 1,000 RBIs. Right uh, on the money. Ryan, is the actual answer higher or lower? Lower. 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 Hey, ah, thank you, Ryan. Thank you for saving right this game. 
show was about to run out. I mean, we, you know, we had another hour left. Hey, I was willing to do math until the end of the show. Yeah, what was the... 870 uh, RBIs. Okay. So. Kirk He's Gibson, a, really, like I said, from the Hall of really, really good. Won an MVP, the Dodgers, right? 1988. I mean, he had a great career. But, he was also uh, born on the same day as my mom. That I really did not know. May 28th. That's so, awesome. Day go. after... Uh, my wife, Loriello. And my birthday's on May 25th. Okay. We got lots of we're birthdays starting to get we're, we're starting to give out too much information, but that's, that's okay. That's not true. Uh, early in the NCAA regional Sweet 16 matchup, who'd you like here, Marquette or North Carolina State? You like uh, NC State. NC State 9, Marquette 7. Okay, great. Obviously, it's early. Yeah. But I like to give you the updates thank you for that i'll continue updating that the gonzaga purdue game tips in about 20 minutes i will say this i'm a lot more relaxed watching those two games tonight <laughs> than i was of course watching uh the aztecs last night so we'll keep rolling towards six o'clock big fives coming up shortly tony returns for that segment do not go anywhere we'll check traffic right now and then more gwen and chris From
Hi, welcome back. Glenn and Chris, 424 is the time. Big Five is just around the corner. On uh, Saturday, March 9th, that's three weeks ago, North Carolina State lost to Pittsburgh 81-73 to to finish the regular season on a four-game losing streak. They had a record of 17-14. and They finished in 10th place in the ACC. We know what's happened since then. They won five in a row to win the ACC tournament. Now they're in the Sweet 16, and they're making Marquette look bad right now. 20-12 to 12, NC State over Marquette in the early going. I don't know what happened with that team. I'm not close enough to you know following that, but they just caught fire. Something's gone crazy, and NC State can't be slowed down right now. They've so we'll see fire. how far they keep it going. Purdue and Gonzaga tip off in a few minutes. Do I have time for a quick football story? Uh, well, I want to first tell you that uh, Kirk Kenny said that Gibson was a wide receiver. Uh, okay. Uh, I might. Eh, all right. I thought it was a DB. All right. Well, no, Maybe, I'm not saying that you're wrong. You know who might have been a DB at Michigan State? Who? Garvey. Steve Garvey. Yeah. All right. I'm going to Garvey went to Michigan State. Story. Garvey went to Michigan State. So maybe he's the DB. But uh, Gibson also went to Michigan State. I know that. Okay. But I think Garvey did also. All right. That's where I may have got confused on the DB. But look all that up. He was a wide receiver. Kirk Gibson. Yeah. So Garvey might have been a DB. I'm going to look at Garf. Uh, the While you look at that, I'll tell everybody that according to Adam Schefter, the New York Jets uh, have acquired a pretty good player here from the Philadelphia Eagles. I haven't seen this. Hassan Reddick. Oh, edge wow. Edge pass rusher from the Eagles, traded to the Jets. Uh, Reddick had 11 sacks last year, played 74% of their snaps on defense. I believe he was the one who broke Brock Purdy's arm two years ago. I think he was. Jets, all they have to give up. I says, I don't get this. But I'm, you know, I don't understand draft picks. Uh, third round pick, conditional. That's it. You get like an all pro player for a third round pick. That just seems really smart. I was reading into this a little bit about the valuation of draft picks and why it seems like they're giving up good players for bad draft picks. And it's it's a lot about contracts too. Okay. Like how his contract lines up with your well, payroll. And- last four seasons in the NFL, two players have had 10 or more sacks. One of those is Hassan Reddick. The other is Miles Garrett. So I think that's a pretty good pickup for the Jets. Yeah. And they don't have to give up a whole lot for it. Coach Robert Sala. Sala well, I never can pronounce his name Sala, right. Sala, yeah. Sala. Said, quote, the more, the merrier. He's happy with this signing, I'm sure. They've actually added a lot. They have. A lot, Chris. Yeah, and they get Aaron Rodgers back, one would presume, unless he, you know, ends up as president of the United no, States. He said somehow. he's not going to do it. So <laughs> it's never you never can tell. He might change his mind. Yeah. Uh, Miami Dolphins today make big news, Scrape. They uh, add an additional year to the contract of Raheem Mostert. So what? There's your who NFL cares? news. Like, not not who cares, but like, what's the point? I don't know. I think he was going to run out. They don't want him to run out. I mean, the guy plays like seven games a year. He played them all last year. He might have missed one or two. He, he played twenty one TDs. He could have. He had to play more than seven games right. to I score twenty one right. touchdowns. I, I guess I was wrong. had a nineteen uh, combined nineteen hundred yards total offense. I'd say it was a good year for. Raheem Mostert. So he makes a little more money. Okay. Uh, Bottom of the hour. Big five coming up. Stick around. Tony's back for that segment. An all baseball big five today. How about that? Yeah. Not a bad call with baseball having just started. I told you I'm very excited. You're really uh, on the the cusp of what's going on. I'm very, very proud of that. Yeah. Stick around.
Junior, Petco Park. Padres, Petco Park. Giants, game two of the four-game series. Don't know that they'll play all four. It's supposed to rain tomorrow and Sunday. And we all know what that means. Can't leave our house. Can't Chris do really anything. Chris doesn't like it when they predict rain. I don't like the fact that our reaction to it is that we have to shut our lives down. That's what I don't well, like. You know, I, I it's feel, just some rain. I feel get an umbrella, put a jacket on, and go do what you got to do. No, what they're Stop trying to whining. avoid is the people driving through ten foot puddles in Mission Valley and getting stuck. That's what they're trying That's to on avoid. Them. If you're if you're too stupid to not drive your car through a fifteen foot puddle, I can't help you. I kind of agree with you, but thank you. I Celebrate and you. save at Ashley's anniversary sale. Hot buys, your choice of color starting at just $339. Ashley sleep mattresses start at $250. Plus, receive a free adjustable base with select mattress purchases. It's only at Ashley. Only here on 973 The Fan do you get a daily dose of the big five. And it's coming up right about now. It's that time of the show when we check on the latest in sports. Only the most important topics and questions are brought to light. Stop what you're doing and listen. These news stories will astound and amaze you. The one, the only. Oh my God, who the hell cares? The Big Five starts now on 97.3 The Fan. First big five of the regular season. Everybody, everything just seems so much better now that baseball is underway. I gotta say, guys. Yeah. I gotta yeah. say. Well, you're making it better because you've already uh you've already given the Padres the pennant based on two okay. successive performances okay. in a row. And okay. I'm trying to calm you down a little bit. I, I, I need to be excited about this I need you need to be excited about something. That's something to be excited about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yesterday I know I said it a million times. This team is different, Chris. You know what we had to do yesterday, Tony? We had to go back to last year after ten games when the Padres were six and four <laughs> and they had just swept three in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And we called up the beginning of that Monday show. Yeah, I went back. Just to see how excited we were that day. Just trying to remind Scraby that a little early season excitement can be dampened quickly. Chris came on and he was like, and that Nelson Cruz, yes! <laughs> Nelson Cruz is the RBI leader. The Padres are in first place. All was good in the world. Oh, I think he said right where they should be in first Right where place. they should be, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were, yeah, very we were excited. pretty excited at that time, too. That's hilarious. So, yeah. That's a great reminder, though. That's good Good on you guys. Yeah. yeah. That was good. good thought, Chris, because I was totally feeling it last year, too. All right, here we go. Number five. And speaking of it being early in the season, I know that we are just three games in, so I realize this is not a huge deal, but Johnny Brito has struggled in his first two appearances of the season. He's faced seven batters and has only logged two-thirds of an inning while giving up four earned runs. I am not going to ask you guys if you are worried about Johnny Brito, but Tony, what I want to ask you is how Mike Schill, how you think Mike Schill handles him in the next few games. Uh, the same way he handled him the first game. Okay. Just keep throwing them out there and see. What do what you? <laughs> no, no. Here, know, here's my thought. I'm I not know, saying bench I, him. I, I'm I not saying anything not, like that. I know you don't want to ask the question, but the question still is insinuated the same way. So I'll say it by saying like saying it like this. Chris is giving me this little head nod. Like <laughs> you guys are not right in this in this <laughs> instance. I'm not going to be drawn into your web of deceit. <laughs> deceit. That's right. Okay. You basically, he's. It's his first opportunity. He's going to have to use them the same way. Now, if he goes out the next time and he doesn't get it right, maybe he says, all right, I'll try. I, I won't put him in that spot. But I just think it's it's really early to to make a decision one way or other at this point. Brito just couldn't throw his breaking ball um, worth anything that was fooling anybody. He was leaving it up. And if you're not executing, you know, that's, that's the problem. It wasn't as though he came in and walked the house or – he just couldn't throw that breaking ball for a strike, and it burned him. Uh, Chris, I know this is really early in the season, but how do you think Mike Schill handles him? I think forward? you send him down. You to the send minor him leagues. to AAA. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I think that's it. We can't. We you know if we're gonna have a championship season, we can't afford any hiccups along the way. Um, You're right about that, Chris. That's right. Um, no, I think that 
you know, I don't know. I mean, he, he was in the seventh inning with a one run lead and that's a pretty high leverage situation yesterday. Uh, maybe he's earned that, but I think I have to, you know, maybe give him a tie game or, you know, a run behind just to give him an inning of work so that he feels good about himself. I, you know, I thought it was interesting that after the game, Xander Bogarts referred to Johnny Brito right away. He did. When he was asked about the game, Tony, I don't know if you heard his interview, but With Sam, he did. Yeah. Yeah. He was asked about, you know, Xander, you know, Sam asked him, what'd you think of the game? And he goes, well, the one thing I wanted to make sure was we won it for Johnny Brito. Cause he was really down on himself and that's how you pick up a teammate, et cetera. So, you know, you got to make sure this guy keeps his confidence. And I think a good way to get his confidence back is just get him an inning somewhere where he can uh, relax a little bit instead of having a one run lead. So See, that, that's I, what I, I might do. I think that it could work reverse in that way, right? Like when he comes out of this game, part of the reason why he's down as a young guy, you're like, man, I might have just blown my opportunity, mm, right? Yeah, right. You yeah. Get, you're sticking back in there. You start to he obviously he well not even when he's sticking back in there when the phone rings and they go Brito get loose and it's the same situation all of a sudden yeah. that in itself is a is a confidence boost now yeah good flip point. that flip that he gets a call in like the fifth of a of a two run you know for two runs down you, you, you that's that those thoughts start to creep back in your head again like oh man mm. I knew it here we go now I gotta and you know at that point you have to make the decision to to kind of pull yourself out of that and, and get you get the job done but it could work it could work opposite sometimes that's a very, it's a very interesting good point, point. yeah interesting point you must have played some baseball in your time <laughs> yeah yeah For, when i when i said when i said that whole thing about it being cool in the radio or the intercom empire i, I thought man they're gonna send me back to the minors for this right now they're, they're never gonna let and, me talk and, and we stuck with you you did yes you did. did you put me back in coaches Thank five you. years later Thank we're you. regretting that mistake <laughs> how did i know that was coming number four uh, okay, so a few things about this. Tony, you're really lucky you do not have to pronounce this guy's name on a daily basis, but a crazy scene happened last night in the Cubs-Rangers game. I'm going to be very careful with my pronunciation of Miles Mastro Buoni. Yeah. That's a tough name. Yeah, well, if you just say Master Boney, you can get away with it, but you, no! you had to bring attention to it. Well, because I was afraid I was going to say something that was not radio friendly. I'm just going to call him Mr. Miles here from now on. Mr. But, Miles. Uh, runners on first and second in the top of the ninth. He appeared to foul off the second pitch, but when the ball bounced past catcher Jonah Heim and onto the grass, the umpire Chad Fairchild didn't see uh, signal that there had been contact, even as the catcher pleaded for, the, for it. Um, but there was nothing the Rangers could do. That type of play isn't considered reviewable scenario by MLB rules, and it remained a pass ball. After the game, Fairchild watched the replay and spoke with reporters saying, well, I'm just going to stick with what I did on the field. If you've got questions for that, I'm not going to talk about videos, <laughs> end quote. Yeah. Chris, is I mean, is this a reviewable play in your mind? Everything should be a reviewable play. That's That would end this, and I, and I know that I have support from one Jesse Agler, because he mentions this often in his broadcast. Just make everything reviewable. You don't have to worry about it. You've got the technology. We can slow down the video. If it is really that inconclusive, then you're you know you're going to go with the call. But at least have the ability to review something. Uh, I think it's silly to have the technology and not use it in certain instances. So this, to me, is a really easy one to solve. All right, uh, Tony, is this reviewable? Is this a reviewable play in your mind? I think this is should be on the list of, of things that are reviewable. I don't think these jokers should be given a full <laughs> slate <laughs> slate of, of, of challenges to challenge whatever you want. We'll be here all day. Well, um, poor Tony, you know, you got to yeah. get him home in time for uh, the Seinfeld episode at 11 p.m. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, no no one, that was part of why nobody was coming to the games in the first place was because. No, I agree with you. But... They were taking too long. So No, but if they use their challenge for the game on that play, then they used it, right? Yeah. Oh, no, so... and if it's, if it's going to be that way, yeah, I can. I, I think that would be great. You yeah, no that, extra challenges. No. That one for in particular should be added, though, right? I mean. That ball changed directions. Like it was pretty obvious when you watched it, and especially in slow mo, that he was foul tipped. It. And they ended up losing the ball game because of that. So, uh, I guess I would agree with Chris. Uh, open it up for everything. You still get the same amount of challenge. Yeah, right. yeah. I don't want to lengthen the game. I just want to be able to review everything. 
And I'll tell you another thing. They put that rule in about the first baseline yesterday uh, for this year where the white line mm. doesn't necessarily mean you're outside the baseline. Mm-hmm. And the umpires boxed that up. I mean, Tyler Wade clearly got around that tag. As far as I was concerned, Tony, it was said to be three feet. Now he stepped outside the line, but he did not go more than three feet around that tag. I think the Padres caught a bad break on that. Yeah, I said it when it happened. Uh, yeah. That strip of dirt is not six feet wide. So <laughs> he would need it. I mean, everybody really generally starts in the middle, one step to the right or one step to the left. You're going to have to be in the grass virtually in order to be three feet from where you started. I don't know, unless you are on the very edge of one way or the other, that's where you start to run, which I don't. I think is virtually impossible. Um, you aren't going to be able to get to the – stay in the dirt and be three feet or past three feet. You're just not. Yeah. You're going to be in the grass. And they, I think they did box that one. All right. Number three. The Astros lost yesterday at home, which at least for now is a problem that's carried over from last year. During last season, they were 51-30 and 30 on the road. How is that possible? They didn't play – yeah, oh, 81 games. Uh, there's my math again, guys. Not good. 51 and 30 on the road in the regular season Atrocious. compared to uh, – that was bad. 39 and 42 at home. The uh, trend also continued into the playoffs last year. The Astros were 5-0 and on the road and just 1-5 and at home, losing all four ALCS home games and these series in the process. So, Tony, uh, is this is there something to this, or is it just a coincidence? Uh, I think it's a coincidence. I mean, it may have been something to it last year when they were losing in the playoffs. But, I mean, it's been a whole offseason. Yeah, I don't think there's – I mean, and then again, you know, now that I think about it, they did have the whole batter's eye thing. I don't know if that's been rectified, if it's still the same or not, because there was a lot of complaints about that, if I recall. Um, so, I don't know. If you keep losing games there and our run totals, or the, the offense that is as prolific as it is continues to struggle there – then we might have enough data to start saying, all right, they, they clearly this batter's eye thing is real. But for now, I'll say that it's it's coincidence. Um, I think I think the Astros may be um, finding out how, how nice it was to have Dusty Baker at the helm, possibly, when mm. this season's all said and done. Yeah, right. brought that up. The other uh, day. Chris, what do you think? Well, this is uh, karma, getting the Astros okay. back. And I'm gonna, <laughs> no, you're not, you're not going where you think I'm going here. Okay. Sometimes karma takes a long time to come around. But if you wait long enough, it'll get you. And the word was, when the Houston Astros played their games way back when in the Astrodome, Tony, you may remember this. Oh, yes. They were they were accused of turning the air conditioning on mm. and blowing it in from center field when this. the other team was at bat and then reversing the airflow when they were at bat. And a lot of people thought the Astros, way before the uh, the trash can incident, were doing a little cheating way back when. Well, guess what? They don't have that advantage anymore because they don't play in the Astrodome. But now, instead of winning a bunch of close games like they used to at home, they're losing. Karma wins again. Karma wins again. That's Chris all says. I can think of. All right. Because otherwise, this makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense. Um, okay. Next one. We're, that was number three. Okay. Yeah. Number two. Um, yeah, just, your math is yeah. so good, you it's don't even know what comes point. after three. <laughs> yes. <laughs> two <laughs> comes after three. Uh, Rays fans are not feeling something the Rays do every year. And this year, they're being very vocal about putting an end to it. I didn't know this, but the Rays hang a banner every year, even if they're just a wild card team. Okay. So fans understand that winning a division or a pennant, and of course the World Series, is worthy of a banner. But a wild card series appearance is not something they want to see hanging from the rafters, and they're asking their really? team to stop doing. They want them to take this. it down. No, they're just saying, can, can we please stop? Uh, you know, we had ninety nine wins last year. We we didn't really do great in the playoffs, and so please stop doing this. Chris, should the Rays stop doing this? I can understand uh, the fans thinking the way they do, and I could also understand it if it was, uh, you know, a franchise that was you know had been around forever and was just hanging every single possible banner and they had him strung up all over the stadium but the rays are pretty new to the playoffs it seems like they make them every year now but they're in a division with the yankees they're in a division with the red Sox. i think when they accomplish that i think it's i think it's a feather in the organization's cap and i think most people think it is too so 
I can understand why the Rays wanted to put it up there. Um, it just signifies a successful season. And um, look, the Padres, I, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, they didn't raise anything at all a couple of years ago, right, when they got the wild card. Hmm. But they got to the NL Championship Series. So, you know, to me, 2022, right? Yeah. Yeah, 2022 was a great season in Padre history, Mm -hmm. but it's not notified anywhere in the ballpark, right? Because they didn't win a division and they didn't win a pennant. So, I don't know. I don't think – I'm not that upset with this. What about you, Tony? Are you upset with the race for putting up a wild card banner? I know you're probably super upset. No, I'm not upset. I was. I'm not gonna lie. I thought that um, you were gonna go someplace completely different. I didn't know like what? Getting this upset about a wild card banner? I, oh. I think that's. I think it's certainly. Um, I think it's worthy of recogni- recognition. Recognition. Hmm. Um, you don't have to make it the same color as your divisional ones or, you know, your World Series appearance. But um, I still think it's a successful season. I, I think you should celebrate those because although. Things are going good now. It's, it's not doesn't always mean it's going to be like that. There's, it, we see it all the time. Teams going 10, 15 year droughts, and you'll be wishing that you could hang a wild card banner again. That's very true. They will be wishing. Chris, what if the Rockies, if they even just they make it out of, wishing. if they're like fourth place, do they hang a banner this the year? Rockies are going to put up a banner for ten wins this year. <laughs> <laughs> ten wins. <okay. laughs> they're going to signify that accomplishment. Number one. Now, Atlanta Braves manager Brian Snicker's family did not go to Philadelphia on opening day. He called out Phillies fans in spring training. I missed this, but he said he was uh, they had objectionable behavior from Phillies fans in the playoffs. Who did this? Uh, Brian Snicker. Okay. Uh, there was objectionable behavior from Phillies fans towards his wife and other Atlanta friends and family members during the playoffs. He said in a radio interview a few weeks ago, quote, it's rough there and they don't seem to mind either. Quite honestly, it was rough on them all last year to the point where it was concerning for his family. Tony, are the Phillies fans the quote unquote worst in baseball? Well, I mean, I'm sure to folks outside of Philly. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure they I'm sure they feel like that. Um, Tony played is, there, remember? I know. This, this so he's loved in Philadelphia. I know. This I is know. this isn't anything new, uh, by the way. Philly has always been thought of as some of the worst fans to deal with uh, from an op- opposing team, and uh, you know what? It's kind of supposed to be that way. Now, whether Philly fans go further than than other fans, I, I don't know that that's necessary. True, there seems to be a lot of we keep discussing this, but there seems to be a lot of bad behavior. No matter where you go, it seems like in stadiums. But I'm sure Philly's dialed up a little bit more than uh, some of the others. And uh, to answer your question, are they the worst fan base in terms of uh, 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 the opponents going in there? I would say yes. All right. So Chris has been worried about uh, Mr. Go heading over to Philly well, for that's a while a, now. That's the city I bring up every time, isn't it? <laughs> it is. That's what I'm saying. It. You always say But it. I agree with Tony. I think fan behavior is lousy everywhere. And I think Brian Snitker and, you know, the Braves, uh, you know, in a situation like this, uh, I think he ought to look to his own organization to see if he can't get them, you know, a a place to sit up in the press box area or whether, you know, if it's a suite, whatever, I'm sure the Braves could afford it. Um, You know, have them if they want them to tend to the game. You go out in in, in the middle of the fans and in Philadelphia and you wear a bunch of Brian Snitker gear and cheer the manager, I don't know what else you expect Philadelphia fans to do. (laughs) They're not going to welcome you with open arms. That's just – that should be expected and almost understood. And I agree with Tony. Uh, It's not any different with the Mets. It's not any different with the bleacher bums at Wrigley Field. Right. Yankees, Red Sox. And ask Dodger fans how Padre fans treat them. Not any better. I, it's so, I mean, fan behavior is at an all time low. I mean, we've been going through this for, you know, on and on here. So, you know, I don't, I don't really put this on Philadelphia fans. I put it on just behavior of people, just behavior of people. Okay. Yeah. That's probably pretty fair to be so, honest. Yeah. All right. Well, that's that was it good. For... That was an all baseball big five today. What that, that was. Yeah. That was that? Strong, strong. All baseball oh, big thanks. five. Well done. Thanks. I told you I'm ready for baseball. I was sitting there last night looking up guys. I could pick up on my fantasy team. Yeah. 
I'm ready. Well I'm done. Ready. All right, we'll get you set for this game tonight between the Padres and the Giants when we get back here on 97.3 The Fan. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Danik. Just a few problems here crashing the Birmingham on-ramp to southbound 5. Doesn't seem to be really causing much slowing. Now, south 805 past the 163. There is a stall vehicle in the center divide. Also crash clearing from the main street on-ramp to southbound 805. I'm Kelly Danik with Gwen and Chris, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. Every Thursday at 10 a.m., Ben and Woods, Annie and Elston, and Gwen and Chris will come together to talk odd race baseball in our weekly fan roundtable presented by San Diego Roundtable Pizza. For takeout or delivery, go to roundtablepizza.com. Roundtable Pizza, the last honest pizza. Ralph's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices. And when you download the Ralph's app, you can enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. Plus, you can earn fuel points to save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. So it's easy to save big.
Hits right now on 97.3 The Fan. And welcome into our uh, Friar Friday happy hour. Yep, coming up on the Padre pregame show, about 40 minutes from right now, Sammy Levitt will take over from the loft down at Petco Park. If you're on your way down to the ball game, a uh, couple of things. Number one, check in, say hi to Sammy Levitt doing the pregame show. I heard somebody uh, yesterday through the, uh, you the know, we can line. hear through the, vo- no, through the, uh, Listening through the board here. Oh, yes. the uh, Somebody came up to Sammy Levitt yesterday and go, are you Scraby? No, he did not. <laughs> Ask him. Really? It was awesome. That is hilarious. It was awesome. I would, oh my gosh, if I'm confused for Sam Levitt, that is the highlight of my life, but the low yes. light of his life. Yes, that he was it, confused it, with me. I think it caused him uh, a, a lot of problems. Sam's way too well dressed to be, <laughs> to, to be to you. Me. Yes. Sammy Levitt's got the pregame show. He's in the loft up there in the uh, Western Metal Supply Building. Go on and say hello. I do have tell to him, mention. Tell him Scraby sent you. Yes, please do. I do yeah. have to rem- mention that it is not just the Padres pregame show. It is the Eco Water SoCal Padres yes, pregame show. I'm aware. Show. Thank you. Eco Water SoCal Padre yes, pregame yes, show. I had to say that. I'm glad you did. Uh, that's coming up in about 40 minutes. And then, of course, Padre baseball tonight with uh, No No Joe on the hill taking on the Giants, the G Men. They don't call them that in baseball. Only the New York football Giants get ever called the G Men. That is true. Chris Berman. So he's called the G men made him sound a lot cooler than they really were. <laughs> San Francisco giants, Kyle Harrison, young left-hander will throw for San Francisco tonight. Lineups are in for the giants. Uh, Mike Yastrzemski sits down today. Uh, Lamont Wade jr. Moves out to right field and Wilmer Flores gets to start at first base. Otherwise the same giant lineup as yesterday for the Padres. Same lineup as well as yesterday, except Bottom two spots, Eggie Rosario gets to start at third base tonight for Tyler Wade. And uh, Jose Azokar gets a call in center field, plays to Jackson Merrill. Now, keep in mind, Giants have a left-hander on the mound, so Padres counter with a couple of right-handed bats at the bottom of the order. Uh, we'll hear Mike Schultz's reasoning on that in just a moment, but want to update you, NCAA tournament. Sweet 16 games, Gonzaga and Purdue. They're midway through the first half. Gonzaga is hanging tough. As a matter of fact, leading Purdue, 22-20. to 20. Uh, Like I said, they're midway through the first half, 22-20. And then the other game is quite surprising. North Carolina State, from just out of nowhere, first of all, to get into the tournament, now to get into the Sweet 16, now to be dominating Marquette. It's not even really close. I didn't see the score, but North Carolina State 37, Marquette 24 Ooh. at halftime. Shaka smart. Come on, man. Shaka. Laka Laka. <laughs> Boom, better, Shaka Laka. Yes, better get with it. <laughs> He's down by 13 at the half. Uh, the interesting thing to me there is when North Carolina State won its amazing national championship back in 1983. And I know it's a long time. If I could turn back time. Do, do, do. The famous Jim Valvano. Thank you. The famous Jim Valvano national championship game. You know who they beat to win that national championship? Do you remember, Scrape? It was a famous team. Oh, man. They beat the Phi Slamma Jamma Houston Cougars. Oh, with, uh, was that Hakeem? Clyde Drexler and Akeem Olajuwon were both on that team. NC State won the national championship. I bring that up because if NC State wins this game over Marquette, their likely next opponent would be the University of Houston. Things come around sometimes. Do you Full see circle. what's happening here? I see what's happening here, but I don't think UConn cares. I don't think they do either. <laughs> I think You're UConn's right. just going to massacre everybody. Do their own thing. After what they did to us yesterday. Uh, all right. Uh, Mike Schilt. Well, let me also remind you, Dylan Cease, our interview, Friar Friday interview, Tony and I had with the Padres' newest right-hander is coming up in about 10 minutes. So. Do not go anywhere. But in the meantime, let's hear a little from Mike Schilt. Pre-game out at Petco Park today. We'll take you out to his pre-game press conference, and he was asked about why he is sitting Jackson Merrill this evening. 
It, it, it is a lot of benefits, you know, primarily to get sugar on the field and get him playing and create an opportunity for him that allows him to be successful. Um, it also, you know, look, it allows Jackson to get, not that he needs a day off, he's like 20 years old. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to hit for him a lot during the game against the lefties necessarily. Uh, we're going to let him play as a regular player, but it also, it's going to be a long season for Jackson. So, you know, let's, uh, let's create an opportunity for sugar that makes sense. And um, let's be smart with the residual benefits that can come with that. Uh, what, is, what is the benefit for Hassan on the fifth? Say that again, I'm sorry. What is the benefit for Hassan Kim on the fifth spot? Oh, um, the question, well, Kim hitting fifth. Look, I, I like our lineup a lot. You know, a lot of times in the lineup, it's about what that player can bring to that part of the lineup. And in Kim's case, I love where he's hitting in the dive hole. Um, there's a I've mentioned this, but there's an opportunity there in that spot for a guy that's going to be have people on base. And in Kim's spot, he puts the ball in play a lot. He takes his walks. Um, so going to because going to put you tough in that situation with with the people we're going to have on front of him. So he's not going to expand the zone a whole lot. He's going to take what the pitcher gives him. He's not on the ground a ton. He doesn't so he didn't hit a lot of double plays. Um, and he uses the whole field, which is what a lot of run producers that drive in runs do. So I just think it's a good spot for him. I think it would have been a good spot for Mike Schultz to say, you know, I bat him fifth. Because I want to? Because I want to. No, I, I really – But, you know, Mike Schultz not like that. No. He has a detailed explanation for everything. He doesn't do anything just by chance. No, I'm learning a lot about right? baseball through Mike Schultz. Yeah, yeah he's, he, he doesn't just bat him fifth because that's a good time to write those letters down on the scorecard. <laughs> he's got a reason behind it. And, um, yeah, Mike Schilt takes everything quite, uh, you know, I mean, he he pours over his research, he does. you know, before he makes a decision. He has a thoughtful answer for everything. He does. Really. That was a very thoughtful answer. What about uh, you You got a little chuckle here in studio when he said Jackson Merrill doesn't I had to chuckle. Be yeah, I had a day off because he's 20, yeah. and there's just no way he needs a day off. But I, you're going to start a Zocar once in a while against a left-handed pitcher, if not more times than not. So. Yeah. Uh, that's an easy one. Um, I thought it was interesting. They did a Bob Scanlon, our guy, had a lot of airtime yesterday in the opening game. He sure did. Including an entire half-inning interview of Jackson Merrill's parents. Hair was impeccable. Of course. Uh, Sammy the barber made sure of that. <laughs> that's true. Scanlon and I have the same barber, for those who are wondering. It's kind of strange. Well, one of those small world hair. departments. You yes, guys we do. Hair. He has great hair. I have this. So <laughs> there you go. Um, but no, part of the interview with Jackson Merrill, they were showing pictures from Jackson's Little League days. Okay. You know, him out on the field. Yeah. And Mark, Mark Grant, when they came back to him, brought it up and said, you know, those pictures are only 10 years old. True. They're not very old. No. It wasn't long ago. They that were Jackson, taken on cell phones. Yes. Jackson Merrill was in Little League Baseball like eight years ago. The, he's living the dream right now. No he's kidding. living the dream. No kidding. Being 20 years old, making your major league well, debut, the only other guys center are, field. Uh, the only other guys that have done it are what, Griffey and uh, Andrew Jones? Something uh, like I'm that? I'm not sure, but those are great names. Guys that are 20 years old playing starting opening day center field. That's incredible. Fantastic. Fantastico. Okay, what else did you have from Mike Schilt? There was uh, one he's other. Gonna, yes, the, he was asked if he expects Joe Musgrove to straighten some things out tonight. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely expect that. You know, always excited when Joe Musgrove goes to the mound. It's a pretty good day for San Diego Padres. Um, yeah, you mentioned you. He's fantastic yesterday. Expect more of the same from Joe, and I know we're going to get everything he's got. How much does that help having Darvish and Joe ahead of Cease and King? How much do they get a chance to see what Darvish and Joe are doing to sort of learn a lineup and see some tendencies possible? Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. You know, I, I think in a big picture, it always is helpful. And I believe our Shars will do it, be intentional about what they're seeing, and then communicate and then work together. You know, we know they have different arsenals and different pitch shapes and different ways and, you know, of approaching their strengths and approach, approaching the other team. Um, but I do think it's really healthy when they watch and see the game and then interact amongst themselves about what they're seeing, coupled with the catchers and, and Ruben and the pitching staff um, to draw, you know, what can specifically work for them. I think it's always healthy. So far, you've been able to be really dynamic with your bullpen, some a little bit by need, and Korea, some by design as well. How important of a tool is that going to be for you as the season goes on, do you believe? Yeah, the bullpen's really important. Um, you know, we clearly have been able to be a little more assertive relative to the schedule. 
now that we're getting into the rhythm of a season and the, you know, playing seven in a row um, with not as much downtime in between, you know, we have to manage that a little differently. Um, but we have been able to be a little more aggressive. Um, we able to do it, you know, yesterday, obviously Matsu was, was big, you know, he got like, you know, he got a five out save, but the double plate in the seventh was, was really huge because it allowed him not to have to get that extra out with pitches in the seventh, which allowed him to go grab the eighth. So, um, you know, the thing about bullpens that I'm sure we'll talk about a fair amount this season is, you know, it's it's uh, every day is a different day relative to who's available and stuff in a silo. But we have been able to be assertive with it relative to our schedule and we'll always do things based on what we have and that particular day and what what's coming up as well with a little bit of an eye towards that. And uh, celebrity appearance in that clip from Bob Scanlon. Yes, asking great questions. Again. Asking good questions as always. Mustache or no? Like everybody's got a mustache now, by the way. Scanlon's got one. Mark Grant's got one. Have you not noticed this yet? I, Is this giving you well, information that you're not aware no, of? No, I, I didn't watch the TV broadcast yesterday because oh, that's true. You I was at the, the game. game. Yeah, no, Scanlon and uh, Mark Grant both uh, doing the mustache thing. And uh, from what I'm told, A, they want to do it, B, Peter Seidler. Yes. Um, Gruppner has one too, Eric Gruppner. Eric Gruppner's wearing one also. Yeah, someone speaking told me... of mustaches, Dylan Cease had the best one in baseball. Yeah, let's talk about his before he got to the Padres. Now he's wearing a beard along with it. You will find out all about that as part of our interview with Dylan Cease, which is coming up in just a few moments. So uh, stick around for that. But again, Mike Shilton, again, well thought out answers and not just a bunch of gobbledygook. I mean, a lot of managers just kind of give you the lip service. Oh, yeah. You know, we had. Yes, I was Mike gonna... Schilt actually teaches you something as he's speaking. He does. Remember the, the days, past. Chris, of um... Chase well, Tingler? Well, what was his phrase that we used to hear all the time? Chase Tingler? Yeah, I yeah. I don't remember. It was like... Um... I don't know. Chase Tingler drove me oh, crazy. Oh, we're going to battle. Chase Tingler just drove me crazy because he wouldn't put the lineup out, and I had to do a pregame show, and I could never get the lineup from him. I don't know how much Chase Tingler was. Well, whatever, whoever, whatever, he was the manager at the he time. He was, he was. So I, used to, I used to curse his name every time. Where's the lineup? You did. And I was a pregame guy in those days, Scrabe. You yeah, were too. I was. They finally got rid of us and got a real pregame guy in there. Hey, we found out last year that Sam... It's good luck, but maybe not all the good luck. No, the champagne did not flow last year. No, no. For Sam. But uh, there's another year underway. Uh, Gonzaga 29, Purdue 28, late first half. And as I said, NC State by 13 over Marquette at the half. Score update there. Traffic here. Dylan Cease after that. From the
A sixth round draft choice by the Chicago Cubs 10 years ago. That's how it all began for Dylan Cease. Sixth round. Tom Brady. Yes. You know, you never know what's going to happen in the sixth round. You don't. He's out of uh, Milton, Georgia. Doesn't really have a whole lot of a southern twang, though. No, I didn't didn't notice. notice that as well. He's been in Chicago a while with the White Sox. Got traded over to the Padres, as you know, just before the start of this season. And I was very impressed that he hopped immediately on a plane and by himself, real not him by himself, but I think he may have been by himself. Right. With, uh, with yeah, the other passengers, but yeah, he flew to Korea. <laughs> like he didn't even have, I don't even know that they, you know, made him do that. I don't think so either. I mean, they he wasn't really going to pitch over there, Yeah, but he, he wanted to get with his guys as soon as he could. And uh, we wanted to get with him as soon as we could. Tony and I did catch up with him a little earlier today, our first Friar Friday interview of the year with the guy they're calling the right-handed Blake Snell. First Friar Friday of the year. We get none other than newly acquired Dylan Sees. Dylan, first, welcome to San Diego, man. Welcome to the show. Happy uh, 2024 season. Oh, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's great to be here. A, uh, it's, it's definitely as sunny in San Diego as, Everyone has, has told me, so it's been great to be here. <laughs> well, I, I'm glad you're going to get at least a day of this in because it sounds like we're going to have some rain tomorrow and Sunday. Yeah, um, looking like what, it. Yeah, well, let me talk to you a little bit about the, the transition. Obviously, uh, you get traded over here to, to San Diego at the time where we're all in Phoenix where spring training is. And um, I think everybody just assumed that we see you what, once we came back from Korea since we were leaving on the day you were traded. But <laughs> Nevertheless, you yeah. end up in Korea. Just talk about the kind of whirlwind you went through uh, to just to get to Korea and now finally being back in the States. Yeah, so I got the call probably around three or four in the afternoon. And uh, at first, it was, you know, they were kind of saying like, hey, you might have to get on a 7 a.m. flight to, to Korea. And uh, I was, you know, kind of just in a scramble to like get everything taken care of and figure out the logistics and Thankfully, they were able to find me a, a nighttime flight. So, uh, yeah, so 4 o'clock it's called and start preparing, start getting everything ready. And uh, that, that following day, I wake up and uh, I go to the White Sox facility. I get all my stuff, say goodbye, everyone, and kind of just have stuff to do throughout the day to just, you know, get to the point where I can make it to the airport. And then uh, finally make it to the airport, have uh, around 7, have a two-hour two hour layover in LAX. And then uh, a 13 hour hot flight over to uh, Korea. <laughs> Dylan, obviously, it was very important uh, for you to, you know, be with your new teammates as soon as you could. And, uh, you know, I think it was a great, a great, uh, you know, move on your part, you know, to say, hey, I'm now a Padre. I want to get right there and be with these guys. Uh, you know, every time we ask guys about being traded, I, I think there's a little more to it than we just think. Um, mm-hmm. you know, you're not just a name on a roster. You're a guy that got to know all these people in Chicago, got settled there. Uh, has it been at all difficult for you to make the transition or is, is there a little happiness in the sense that it doesn't appear like the White Sox are going anywhere anytime soon? Yeah, it's, it's always challenging. Um, like you said, there is there is the human element behind it where we are more than just, you know, our stats and our this and our that. But uh, I feel like it took me, within a couple of days, I was kind of getting, you know, really settled in with the idea and, and uh, you know, getting getting more used to it. And I'm, I'm at the point now where as soon as I figure out my housing, I, I pretty much really feel settled here. Um, this uh, I've been really impressed with, with everyone with this organization and just how comfortable and easy they've made everything. So. I already feel like I'm, you know, a part of the team. And although there is an aspect of that where, you know, you kind of have to earn, you know, you still have to earn everything. So, you know, I want to go out and perform and, and you know, pull my weight. But uh, it's, it's been a great experience so far. And, uh, yeah, it was definitely bittersweet because I had a lot of good friendships and relationships and uh, really was just very comfortable in Chicago. Uh, it's a, That's a great city and, and uh, it's it's really enjoyable to live there. So it was uh, – it was – it was interesting to have have to basically, you know, no longer be a part of any of that. So 
I definitely saw my mind, especially on the flight over uh, to Korea, kind of like thinking and, and remembering some, some memories back from Chicago and just how quickly the time went by. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very excited for this new chapter. Dylan Seach joins us here on our first Friar Friday. He'll be tomorrow's starter for the pods. And, and Dylan, it's it's so interesting. You brought up kind of already feeling settled. It was it was kind of uh, eye opening to me. Your I believe it was your first bus ride came on our way to the field uh, in Korea. And the thing I noticed mm-hmm. was how seemingly comfortable. You were with everybody, but more I, I thought was impressive was everybody was comfortable with you. Is that just your normal kind of demeanor or has it been a little bit of, you know, you feel comfortable being in this in this organization? Uh, yeah, I think I mean, I think a big part of it is just it's a really good group of dudes on in on this team and in this organization. So uh, it's just been kind of one of those things where it's been almost seamless and uh I get to know everyone pretty quickly and, and, you know, obviously, honestly, being in Korea is, I think everyone's a little bit uncomfortable. So uh, I think yeah. we're all kind of experiencing something new and kind of, I guess, bonding and sharing, you know, an experience like that. So um, I don't know. It's just, you know, I, I definitely was, I was definitely a bit nervous and a bit anxious and, and all of that. Just, you know, I, like you said, I mean, it was a, a huge whirlwind, um, but, Really, I was just kind of trying to stay in the moment and uh, just keep focusing on on baseball and what I had to do to really get ready for the season. Dylan Cease is with us, and uh, we're really excited to have him uh, here in San Diego and on our program, our first Friar Friday interview of the year. Uh, people around here, Dylan, I don't know if it's got back to you, but they're calling you the, the right-handed Blake Snell. Uh, mm-hmm. That's a pretty high compliment considering Blake Snell just won a Cy Young. You yourself nearly won a Cy Young a couple of years ago. And I'm not big on the analytics of baseball, but they they say that you pitched pretty well last season, very similar to how you pitched two years ago, didn't have the same results. How frustrating was last year for you? And what are you working on to try to get back to two years ago? Yeah, I, I found last year to be pretty frustrating. I, I feel like I really only pitched you know, up to maybe 30 or 40% of my ability. I, I had a lot of starts where I just wasn't executing much of anything. So, um, yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is just really making sure that the process is locked in, which which kind of gets refined every year. And for me, too, it's just making sure the mechanics are locked in and I'm, I'm kind of focused on what I need to focus. And, uh, yeah, it's actually been really nice working with uh, – Kind of getting his input on things and being able to talk with really all the other starters and, and all the other pitchers. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it really at the end of the day, it's just with, with pitching, and it can be something as simple as you just get a little feel from you know, you, you tweak something and, and then all, all of a sudden it's automatic. And unfortunately, it's not always as easy as it you know, happening instantly. Last year, I mean, I really didn't, I didn't really find a good feel toward till the end of the season, but I'd like to think that a year like last year is sort of just like a character building year and, and a year where it's like, you know, if I can go out there and, and pitch and, and do provide value and do things while I don't know where the ball is going and I, you know, don't have a good feel, then, uh, you know, that's kind of like showing that even at my worst, I'm able to, to go out and provide something and compete. So uh, hopefully I just learn from it and, uh, and, you know, carry, uh, carry a little bit better, uh, energy and mindset and all that into this season. Dylan, one of the things I, I, I've noticed in watching you pitch la- last couple of years and in your, your outings here so far in a Padre uniform, um, you are a part of this kind of generation of pitchers, um, and I'd say like in the last 10 years, that doesn't have the long arm swing. It's kind of short, almost mm-hmm. by your ear. Have, have you been one of those guys that was always this way, or did you make an adjustment to kind of get to that where, where you are now? Uh, I never did anything consciously to change that. It just happened as as years went by. Um, I'd like to think it's just my body kind of figuring out the most efficient and, and best way to sustain, you know, high high power output with kind of the endurance and, you know, going out every five days and, and pitching. So uh, if you, there's actually videos out there. My, my twin brother sent it to me the other day, and it's uh, 
some guy made a video of like my arm path from 2016 to now and it, i used to have an extremely long one but really? uh, for whatever reason it's just shortened up over the years twin brother there you go i i yep. here's here's that's something we did not know i don't know that no, anybody knew that but uh Tony, you can uh, you can drop that now on the broadcast. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, hey, Dylan, I, I don't know where I get these some of these crazy questions. Last year, we had a guy named Matt Carpenter. He's now at the Cardinals. And uh, I don't know. The big thing we all noticed about Matt Carpenter is his mustache. So mm-hmm. we get Dylan Cease. And first thing I said is this guy rocks one of the best mustaches in baseball. <laughs> but then you came to San Diego and you've kind of covered it up with the beard. Uh, is this what we're going to get this year? or? Could we see a return to the mustache only? Yeah, anything's possible. Um, <laughs> I had a, I had a much longer beard in in, uh, in Arizona, and then um, before the flight to Korea, I wanted to get trimmed up, and the the guy ended up cutting off a bunch of it. So um, I borderline was ready to to go back to the stash then because I'd, all that hard work I put in just got clipped away, but. It's uh, it's possible. I, you know, for now I'm I'm enjoying the beard, but uh, I I do like the mustache, so I, I would definitely say there's a solid chance it comes back. And now I'll, one more before I let you get out of here, Dylan. Uh, obviously, your start day is tomorrow. Should the weather cooperate, uh, you got the one start here earlier this week. What's your feelings about the pitching in this ballpark and and off that mound? I know every mound is a little bit different. Every city mm-hmm. you go to. You've had the opportunity to pitch here before. Uh, well, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, a pitcher-friendly ballpark. And uh, mix that with one of the best defenses around. Um, you know, all, all the all the cards are definitely stacked in my favor. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, can I go out and execute and, and put the ball where it needs to be put? Uh, but, yeah, I'm feeling great about it. I mean, uh, like I said, uh, definitely, definitely one of the more uh, – advantageous situations of my career in terms of pitching so uh yeah hopefully it's just one of those things that i I get more and more and more comfortable and uh you know i'm able to carry that all the way through the end of the season we definitely know everybody here in san diego certainly excited to have you as a part of this ball club good luck tomorrow on your first start and uh we appreciate you coming on today thank you i I appreciate you guys having me thanks dylan dylan cease there uh for the san diego padres awesome Awesome. Good start to uh, Friar Friday there. Dylan Cease, thank him for coming on. Um, Padres wearing the City Connects tonight. They right? are. I saw them Friday uh, night. So. Hanging up in their lockers. I really like the City Connects. Me too. I thought maybe they'd get a little old on me, but I, I just enjoy the Friday night games and the City Connect, and I, I hope that they stick with it for a long, long while. Uh, a couple of updates here on the NCAA tournament scoreboard. Purdue fending off Gonzaga at this point. Halftime, Purdue 40, Gonzaga 36. Looks like it's going to go through the second half, though. Gonzaga's given them a really good game. And you got to give Mark Few a lot of credit. They 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 stunk when the Aztecs played them earlier this year. And they weren't even that good when USD played them earlier this year. But now here they are. You know, Gonzaga's figured it out. And they're giving Purdue a good one, 40 to 36. Meanwhile, NC State, magic? Maybe. They're up 13 on Marquette, 44 to 31. There is still 15 minutes to go, but NC State led by 13 at the half. Still leads by 13 later tonight. Houston and Duke. Also later tonight, Tennessee and Creighton. And then tomorrow it'll be the Elite Eight and... I'm going to miss being in the Elite Eight because it was fun being in it last year. Yeah. But, you know, Connecticut just would not uh, would not, not have any it. of it. Yeah, of course. All right. Batting down the hatches. The rain could be coming tomorrow and Sunday. You know what that means. Enjoy Padre Baseball tonight. Yes. Joe Musgrove going to take the hill. Sammy Levitt going to take the mic and have the Padre pregame show for you next. For Scraby and Tony, I'm Chris. Enjoy baseball on 97.3 The Fan. Good night. Now 
Now's the perfect time for your new adventure. And AutoNation Subaru Carlsbad is here to help get you out there. We know you'll love the new 2020.